Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology and this video I've been asked to make for at least a year and I'm sorry it's taken so long but I've finally got round to it. This video covers all of the required practicals for AQA A level and not only that at the start I'm going to talk you through the best way to revise the practicals how to use the spec to make sure you know what questions could come up in the actual A level and then at the very end I've got all the general skills that you need to know so things like how to do the scientific drawing how to do a serial dilution the potometer and so much more so this is your one-stop shop for everything practicals. Now the practicals do make up 15% of the questions across your entire A-level, so they are so important. But did you know that the essay also makes up 10% of your marks across your entire A-level? So once you've gone through this video, if you do still think you need more help with the essay, then definitely check out the link below to my biology essay bootcamp, which will be everything you need to try and get full marks on that. But for now, let's get into the practicals. So the apparatus and techniques table, if you've actually heard of it before, shout out in the comments because I would bet that at least 80% of you haven't heard of the apparatus and techniques table before. Unless you've, you know, watched a few of my Instagram videos on this before, but it's one of the best kept secrets. Except it's not meant to be a secret. It's out there, it's public knowledge, it's in your specification. But because it's not within the theory part, which is the bit that most people print off, and me of course too, she can't resist a practical video. It's really not that well known about. And for that reason, students aren't aware of how to revise what resources there are available for them. But that's where I'm gonna come in and help you today. So here it is, the apparatus and techniques table. And you can find this in two places, the required practical handbook or the practical handbook, or in your specification under the practical section. So that is where to locate this or just screenshot it and you've got it here. Now this is the same for AS and A-level. And what I recommend to do is learn all of this information in the table and that is how you revise for the practicals. So let me give you some examples. What I'd suggest first of all is you could create a set of flashcards to address this table. So it says here, for example, the top one, you need to know the appropriate apparatus to record any of those measurements. So you could have on one side of your flashcard how do you measure temperature on the other side thermometer and then you do that for all of the others in the list or you could do it for some of the techniques say for example you could have a flashcard to say when would you use chromatography and then you'd have your answer on the other side or it could be when would you use or why would you use a colorimeter and again give your answer on the other side so have your techniques which would be the using the colorimeter, photometer, aseptic technique, chromatography, electrophoresis. And again, just looking through all of those, you've got sampling techniques as well. And then on the other side of the card, you would say why you would use it. Now for some of these, it does require a particular method. So for example, the use of a light microscope, including the use of a graticule. So you could have on one of your cards, how do you use an eyepiece graticule? And then on the other side, you would have your stages, your bullet points of how you would use it. You could have, how would you randomly sample? And then you have all the bullet points for random sampling method on the other side, or for a belt transect or for mark release recapture. So that is how I'd suggest to use this. And if you're not as much of a fan of the flashcards, which I personally think are great because it tests your knowledge, you could do a mind map, summary map of all the pieces of equipment you'd need to use, looking through the list, and you'd have to research it as well to work out which piece of equipment it is. Um, and then all the techniques you could have summarized on a mind map as well. Now that's how you use this list, but you don't have to learn exact methods. So I said earlier on that just learning the stuff you've got written in your lab books isn't actually the best way to revise because the method that you did in your practical for your um, required practical isn't necessarily going to be the method that you have in the exam. So don't just learn the methods unless there is an exception to that, unless it is a sampling method using the microscopes and aseptic techniques um, and chromatography, because those are actually listed as techniques that you need to learn. So for those, you can learn methods, but for required practical one, for example, there's no point learning the enzyme practical method that you used 
because there's no set method linked to this and there's no set techniques. It's all to do with looking at this column in the table and this is actually found also in the practical handbook um, and in your specification, this table, and it tells you for all 12 required practicals, what are the apparatus and techniques that you could be tested on in the exam? So it already gives you a heads up for these required practicals. These are the types of questions you're going to get. So if we have a look at um, the ones that are coming up in exams 2022 are required practical one, two, three, six, and nine. So let's have a look at number six. We can see apparatus and techniques C and I are what you'll be assessed on. So if you then look back at this table, so apparatus C is the using laboratory glassware, um, a variety of experimental techniques, including serial dilutions. So for exams 2022, learn a method for how you would um, do a serial dilution and learn how you'd calculate this. And the other one is I, use of micro use of microbiological aseptic techniques to grow agar plates and broth. So you need to learn what we mean by aseptic techniques, learn some examples, um, and those would be the two key things to really focus on for that required practical. So that's how you use those two tables together. And the final table they give you is independent thinking and analysis. And this is information for teachers and students. And it tells you, first of all, that at least 15% of the marks on your A-level will be assessing your practical skills. So it's quite a big chunk. And it then gives you an idea of what types of questions you can expect. So it could be problem solving, and this is linking to a practical context. It could be commenting on experimental design. So you could be asked to suggest improvements to the method. You could be asked to suggest control variables or a control experiment. You could be asked to design a table, draw a graph. Um, that has come up before quite a few times. They give you a blank bit of graph paper and you have to draw the graph. Evaluate the results and draw conclusions. That is guaranteed coming up on your A-level. Every single year you get asked, um, evaluate the data, evaluate the method, or evaluate the conclusion. So you know you're going to be asked to do that. We call that critical analysis of data. I've got a video on that, which I'll link up here. 15 marks at least will be on that type of question for paper three. Identifying variables that could be controlled, we mentioned. Plotting graphs, we mentioned as well, linking to this idea up here processing and analyzing data, so the math side of it, uncertainties and looking at margins of error. And then the last bit here, know and understand how to use a wide range of experimental and practical instruments and techniques that links to the first table we looked at. So those three tables give you quite a big insight into what type of questions are going to come up and what they are after. So what sorts of things they want you to talk about. So the first thing to point out with this required practical is there is not one set practical that could come up. There's actually many options because of the way the title is written. So it could be you are given a question where you have to investigate the enzyme concentration or substrate concentration, temperature, pH, or even inhibitors. Now, the most common enzymes that are used in investigations are these four here, amylase, catalase, protease, and trypsin. But again, that doesn't guarantee that if it came up in the exam, it would be one of those enzymes. So although in this video, I'm going to help you to plan one particular practical, bear in mind that you'll need to use these skills transferably potentially in the exam. So the practical that I'm going to be doing is the one that I do with my students, investigating the effect of pH on the enzyme trypsin. So the aim of this investigation is to look at the effect of pH on trypsin activity to try and allow us to identify the optimum pH and also the range of pH values that trypsin works within. The hypothesis, which is a prediction based on research, the prediction I'm going for is that trypsin will work within a range of pHs from pH 4 to 11 and that pH 9 will be the optimum.
Now for this experiment, this is the equipment that you will need. So stop clock, photographic film, and that is actually the source of the substrate for this experiment because the enzyme trypsin can digest and hydrolyze gelatin. So what we'll see is the photographic film will go from being this black opaque color to colorless and clear. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And you've got the rest of the equipment here if you want to pause and write it down. Okay, so the method then. The first step is you'll need to attach your film to a straw. Now, we're actually using film that's already been cut and straws which have already got slits cut in them to slide the film in. If you didn't have that, then that would actually be your first step. Next, we're going to use a syringe to measure out four centimeters cubed of the enzyme trypsin and put that into a test tube. Next, we're then going to measure out four centimeters cubed of a pH 4 buffer solution and put that into the same test tube. And then that test is placed into a beaker with water at 37 degrees C and that is acting as your water bath. We leave that for five minutes and the reason it's five minutes is to allow enough time for the liquid within the test tube to reach the temperature of the water bath, which is 37 degrees C. So the buffer that we've used here, that is to make sure that the enzyme is at a particular pH. And in this case, it's pH four. But we will repeat this process for all of the different pHs that we'll be testing at. Now for this one, we aren't actually using an electronic water bath, it is a manual one. So the students would have used water from the hot tap or maybe a kettle and adjusted it using a thermometer to check until they got to 37 degrees C. So the next bit, once we've left it for five minutes and the solution is at temperature, we'll then place the straw which has the film attached into the test tube. And at that point exactly, you need to start the stop clock. We'll then dunk the straw in and out of the solution every 10 seconds. And when we're taking it out, we're checking to have a look at the film. So I've got an example here. The top image is showing the film before it's been applied to any enzyme. Then we can start to see that that black color is being broken down. Now it's not completely digested here because there is still some black color, but you can see it's almost clear. And that's what point seven here is going through. You need to continue to dunk and check until you reach the end point, which we can see in this photo. The film has now gone completely clear and colorless. And as soon as we get to that stage, we stop the stop clock and that is the time that we'll be recording. Now at some pHs, the enzyme may be fully denatured and therefore none of the gelatin would ever be digested. And if that's the case, we won't have all the time to just wait indefinitely. So after 25 minutes, if there's been no change at all in the film, then stop and record that as infinity or in other words, no reaction. So that will then need to be repeated for all of the pHs that you want to test. You should also repeat using water instead of trypsin in one test tube to use as a control experiment. And that way you can prove it isn't anything about the temperature or the buffer itself, the pH alone, which is causing the change in color and therefore the gelatin to digest. To record the results, I've designed a table here. These are the pHs that I'm testing and I'm going to do three trials and then calculate a mean and then use that mean to work out the rate of reaction. So here are the results that I got when I did this experiment. And you can see at pH four, for every time taken, I've written infinity, so it never changed. But for all of the others, it did eventually change and we did get that end point and we've got our varying times. Now, one thing you're expected to be able to do in your write-ups, but also you could be tested on this within the exam, is if you're asked to calculate a mean, you need to check to see if you have any anomalous results in any of the trials. And if you do, we'd need to remove those and not include them in the mean. So from all of these results, to work out if it's an anomaly, we're looking at the three trials to see are they all pretty much the same? Are there any that clearly do not fit the pattern? 
And sometimes it's hard to tell with only three trials and you might have actually needed more to tell, so you'd have to include all of them. But from what I've had a look at with my results, I've said that for pH 7, trial 2 is an anomaly. 540 is very far away from 300 and 289, so it doesn't fit the pattern. And also at pH 11, I had two trials where I had one at 612 and one at 600 seconds. And then trial 3 was 708, so again, that's quite far away, it doesn't fit the pattern. So those two I won't include when I calculate my mean. Now here are all of my means, but I've deliberately presented it like this to point out one thing you could be assessed on in your required practical write-up, but also in an exam. And that is how you present your numbers in a table. That's actually competency four. So here I've just written in exactly what came up on my calculator. But really, you should be recording them all to three significant figures. So I've converted all of these to three significant figures. And I've also put in my heading in brackets three significant figures to indicate that to anyone that would be reading my results. Now I'm going to use the mean to work out the rate of reaction. And the units here have now popped up second to the minus one. So the way we'd work this out is we'd do one divided by the time taken. Now for pH 4, it never changed colour. So that means the reaction never happened. So the rate of reaction is zero. The rate of reaction for all of the other pH values would be 1 divided by the mean time taken. And that's what I've got written here. But I'm actually going to do one final processing step, and that is convert these to times 10 to the minus 3. And the reason for that is it's much easier to plot this data if you don't have all of these zeros. And it's easier for the human brain to actually process the meaning when you don't have lots of zeros. So it's quite a good um, convention to convert it to times 10 to the minus 3 if you did have lots of zeros, um, or in this case two zeros, after the decimal point. So there we go, those are my results. And now I'm going to plot them on a graph. And this comes to one of the skills that could be assessed in the exam, and it will be considered if you are being assessed on drawing your graphs in the write-up. Now you'll probably do this by hand, but I've done it on a computer here just to demonstrate the point. So I've got my mean rate of reaction with the units, I've got the pH on the x-axis, and the independent variable, so that is what you deliberately change, always goes on the x-axis. What you are measuring, which is the dependent variable, always goes on the y-axis. Now with our pHs and with the mean rate of reaction, we need to make sure we're increasing by an equal amount every time. So I've got that on my scale here. And when you are picking a scale, you need to pick one to make sure that your graph fills up at least half of the piece of paper you've been given. So I've got all of my data points plotted now. And one thing that you're assessed on is whether you should draw a line using a ruler going dot to dot, or should it be a line of best fit? And just bear in mind, a line can either be a curve or a straight line. A line of best fit doesn't mean straight. So it could be a curved line or a straight line of best fit. So the way to work this out is, if you do not have very many data points, it's unlikely that you have enough intermediate points to accurately predict a pattern to therefore use a best fit line. So if you have fewer than 10 data points, it should be dot to dot. And even if you have more, if you don't have a really clear outline of the curve or straight line, then you should still go dot to dot. So for example, on this one, if we did a curve, we would then have to predict which of these points we're going to have the curve most close to, and therefore we're predicting which is more accurate. It'd also be assuming that 9 was definitely the optimum, not 9.5 or 8.5. So dot to dot for this one. The final two things would be the conclusion and evaluation. And to come up with your conclusion, always refer back to your aim and your hypothesis. 
and we said our aim was to investigate the effect of pH on trypsin to identify the optimum and the working range. And we predicted the range would be 4 to 11 and the optimum would be 9. So that's what we predicted. So when we conclude, that is what we're using as our basis for the conclusion. So one thing I'm going to point out as a conclusion is because we had zero rate of reaction at pH 4, we can conclude that trypsin was denatured at pH 4 and therefore it does not work at any pHs at 4 or lower in pH. However, we can't actually conclude at which alkaline value it denatured at because although we do have a significantly decreased rate in reaction at pH 10 and 11, it hasn't actually dropped down to zero. So that means there are still some enzymes that are functioning, so they're not all fully denatured. From this set of data, it does show that pH 9 is the optimum from the ones that we tested. However, we can't conclude that pH 9 is the optimum. And the reason for that is we did not test enough intermediate data points. We know that it's not going to be pH 8 or 10, but it could be at any pH in between then, because we only tested 8, 9 and 10. The optimum might have actually been 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, and then it could have decreased. So we can't conclude for definite on that. And then finally, it's the method limitations. One big thing to point out here is this is a really common question, particularly on paper three, to evaluate the method. Or it could be evaluate the conclusion, but within that you are considering limitations of the method. And when you are expected to do this, we assume the method has been followed perfectly. So you should never be critiquing the experimenter and saying maybe they didn't measure it correctly or maybe there were air bubbles in the syringe because we're assuming that they followed the method and we're just critiquing the method. So these were four things that I picked out about the method that I talked through with you. Number one, the endpoint was subjective. So when you decided it had gone completely clear and colourless was actually subjective, it was up to your opinion. And that will lead to some differences and therefore inaccuracies in the time taken measurements. The water bath was not thermostatically controlled. So that means that the temperature would have been decreasing during the practical. And that would have had an effect on the enzyme rate of reaction. There weren't enough intermediate pHs tested. We've talked about that quite a bit already. It meant that we weren't able to accurately identify the optimum. But also the range wasn't wide enough because we weren't able to identify at which alkaline pH the enzyme denatured. So we should test more pHs beyond pH 11. So this practical is the one where you have to prepare a stained squash of cells and then work out the mitotic index. And what we're going to go through is the equipment method risk assessment, how you then work out the mitotic index and the typical exam questions you get linked to this required practical. So let's start with the equipment. Here we have a range of equipment that you would need to use for this experiment. I'm going to go through the pieces of equipment in particular, which often come up in exam questions that you have to explain why you use that piece of equipment. The rest of it, though, you can pause and write it down if you need it to write up your experiment. So it's these four which typically come up. Why do you use the hydrochloric acid? Now this step, we add our root tip to hydrochloric acid, leave it for 10 minutes, and that is so the acid can soften the root tissues, so that later on when we squash them, they are soft enough for that to happen. We use a stain, and I'm using acetic orsine in my example, and the acetic orsine, or aceto orsine there, um, that stain, as you can see, is a dark reddy purple color and that will stain the chromosomes in the nucleus so they become visible under the microscope. When you lower down your cover slip, you use a mounted needle. The reason for that is 
as you lower it down gently, it prevents any air bubbles coming underneath the cover slip, which would affect your ability to view the slide. And lastly, why do you use the root tip of, and it's an onion or garlic, but the key thing is the root tip, um, and it's just the last five millimeters. That is the growing region of the root. So that means it'll be in that section that cells will be dividing and therefore will be undergoing mitosis. And that's what we need if we want to view cells in mitosis. So let's have a look at the method. The first thing you need to do, and if you're at school, the technician would have done this stage for you, is grow your garlic or onion on top of a beaker of water for about three days. And that can just be a regular onion, regular um, garlic clove. And after three days in water, these new roots will start to grow. And that is what you need for the experiment. So once you have these roots, then you can do the experiment. And you use a scalpel to cut off the last five millimeters. And that's what we can see here with this lovely ruler that one of the sixth formers was using when I took this photo. And um, the last five millimeters, as we said, that's where mitosis is happening. And you need to be really careful when you're using the scalpel because it's very sharp, so you cut away from you to be safe. Once we've done that, we then add our root tip into a test tube with hydrochloric acid and we also put it into a water bath at 60 degrees C. We leave that for 10 minutes, and this is the stage that we said, the acid and with that heat, it will start to soften the cells. Now that they've been left for 10 minutes and they're softened, you then pour off the acid and you rinse your root tip in distilled water just to get rid of that acid. We can then transfer using forceps the root tip to the microscope slide and any of that distilled water that happens to still be on the slide we need to remove. So we put filter paper just next to it and that will soak up any excess water on your slide. Now we're ready to stain our root tip and you add just two small drops of acetic or sink. If you have too much, then again, you can add some filter paper next to it and it'll absorb the excess stain because you don't want so much that it'll then spill over the edges. You then use your mounted needle to carefully lower down that glass cover slip so that you'll end up with no air bubbles. Now, when you leave it for 10 minutes, the liquid will spread across that whole cover slip. But if you do have any areas where the stain hasn't transferred to, you can just put filter paper at the edges and that will draw the liquid along. The main thing is that during those 10 minutes, the stain is covering our root tip because we want the chromosomes inside of the nuclei to become stained over that 10 minute period. Then the very last thing is we need to squash, which is what the title of the experiment is, root tip squash. So you place a bit of filter paper on top and you push down, but you need to do this gently. If you do it too hard, you're going to break the glass cover slip. You also need to make sure that you don't accidentally slip and move your cover slip to the side because that defeats the purpose of the squash step. This stage is to squash down gently so you get this really thin layer of cells so that the light can then pass through them when you're viewing it under the microscope. If you slide the cover slip, you'll end up putting a layer of cells on top of another layer and the light won't pass through and you won't be able to focus your image. You might also actually damage some of the cells and the chromosomes so it ruins your image. So that's how we prepare our slide. The risk assessment, I've picked out two key examples here. Number one, the hazard is the scalpel. The risk is you could cut yourself. How do you prevent this? Well, we cut onto a white tile so that we're less likely to slip, but also cut away from you. Don't ever cut towards you in case you do slip. The hydrochloric acid could be another hazard. The risk is that it's an irritant. If you have a stronger concentration, then it could be corrosive as well. The prevention then to making sure you don't get any harm is wear goggles to protect your eyes. And if you do get any on your hands, wash your hands. Now, there are other things that you could mention. The mounted needle is pretty sharp, so that could be another hazard. And the risk there could be stabbing yourself. Um, the prevention here is just making sure you're taking care that you are holding it from the wooden end, not the metal end, and being very careful when you're moving around with that needle. 
So the last bit then is our observations. And I've actually taken this photo down the microscope looking at one of the slides that my students made. And what you then look at is for any cells that you can visibly see are in one of the stages of mitosis. And I'm gonna zoom this in further. And we can see here, this cell is in anaphase. We can see that the chromosomes have been um, separated. So we've got the chromatids are being pulled to either end of the cell. This one here I've highlighted because possibly that is in um, metaphase with the cells lining up in the middle of the equator. The rest of them, they don't really look like they are actually in um, any of the stages of mitosis because we can't see any visible chromosomes. So possibly they're all in interphase. And unfortunately that happens a lot with this practical. If you've done it already, then you probably found that you only saw one cell or very, very few. Um, unfortunately it often is that way, which is why you should be given maybe a prepared slide and then you can do the mitotic index from a pre-prepared slide where you did have lots of cells in mitosis. So the mitotic index is a bit like a percentage where you're working out what percentage of cells are currently undergoing mitosis. And if we have a look, it's the number of cells in mitosis divided by the total number of cells times 100. So essentially it's the percentage of cells that are um, undergoing mitosis currently. So the typical exam questions you get linked to this required practical would be number one, two and three are linked to the method. So why do you use only the first five millimeters from the root tip of an onion or it could be a garlic? Why do you press down firmly or in our case we said it's actually quite gently but press down is the key thing. Um, and why do you use a stain? Now if you want to have a go at these, pause the video, have a go, but I'm gonna go straight through now answering those questions. So the first three then, why do we use only the first five millimeters? That is because that is the region where you'll find cells are undergoing mitosis, and that's what we want to view under the microscope. We press down to make sure you get a thin layer of cells so that light can pass through. And the key thing is that light can pass through. That would need to be said to get the mark. You can't just say so you get a thin layer of cells. Why do we use a stain? That is to stain the chromosomes to make sure they are visible. So then if we have a look at an example of the mitotic index, um, there's 32 cells in this image, calculate the mitotic index. So they've told us already there's 32, so you don't have to spend lots of time counting every single individual cell. Um, and instead you're just looking to identify which cells that are visible are currently in a stage of mitosis. And having a look, it's just these three which all happen to be in anaphase. Those chromatids are being pulled to opposite poles of the cell. So that's three divided by 32 times 100, which is 9.38%. So lastly, when counting the cells to calculate the mitotic index, what should you do to ensure your count is accurate? So for this one, examine a large number of fields of, views, um, fields of view or many cells. And that is to make sure you have a representative sample. So what we mean by that is this here is just looking at a small section of cells. It's one field of view, which means you're just looking at one section under the microscope. What you should really do is count and calculate it for that field of view. Move your slide over and do the same thing for another field of view and do that at least 10 times. And then you can work out what was the average mitotic index. And that means it'll be more representative of the entire root tip, which is what your sample is. So that's kind of linking to sampling skills, but it's sampling in terms of um, recording and counting the cells under the microscope. So for this required practical, let's just start by doing a little bit of background, a reminder on osmosis. So this is the movement, it's a type of movement which is diffusion of water through a partially permeable membrane from a region of higher water potential to a region of lower water potential or more negative because it's always going to be negative. And that takes us on to what water potential is. So water potential takes negative values of pressure. Pure water has the highest water potential that you can get which is zero kilopascals. And the greater the concentration of solute dissolved in the water, 
the lower the water potential will be, or more negative it will be. So you are going to be investigating the effect of these different water potentials on plant cells, even though this is a picture of animal cells, red blood cells. Um, and we've got three different types of solution. You've got a hypertonic solution, which means that you've got a lower concentration of solute and therefore a more positive water potential, meaning closer to zero. Isotonic is when the concentration of the solute is the same inside and outside of the cell, so you'd have the same water potential. And hypertonic is when you have a higher concentration of the solute and therefore a more negative or lower water potential. And if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, water will move into the cell by osmosis. Now here we see an animal cell and that would burst, but because we're going to be doing the investigation on potato cells, which are a plant, they won't burst. Instead, they will gain mass, they'll swell, but they've got a cell wall, so they shouldn't burst. Isotonic solutions, the plant cells will remain the same because they're not going to gain or lose any water, or at least there won't be any net gain of water or any net loss of water. So the mass and therefore the size of the cell will stay the same. In a hypertonic solution, because there is a more negative water potential outside of the cell, water will leave the cell by osmosis, causing it to lose mass because that water has been lost and it shrivels up. But let's go through then the equipment you'll need, the method, the results, and how we can actually use all of that to determine the water potential of those potato tuber cells. So here we have an equipment list. For the actual exam, you don't have to memorize the equipment list, but this might help with planning. Some of the key ideas that you'd need to know though are what piece of apparatus could you use to measure out volume? So liquids, and that could be a syringe or a measuring cylinder. You could be asked how to cut the potato chips so they are all the same size and how to do it safely. So you'd use a potato cylinder borer where you get those long cylinders of potato. And then you could use a scalpel, a ruler and a white tile to cut it to exactly the same length safely by making sure you're cutting away from yourself with the scalpel. So this method comes in a couple of stages. The first one is we have to make the dilution series of the different concentrations of sucrose we're going to submerge different pieces of potato into and that is going to be giving us those different water potentials. So step one is often working out what different concentrations you are going to be using. We're told that each time that you are making up one of these solutions, your starting concentration is one mole per decimeter cubed. We know that the final volume has to be 20 centimeters cubed. So we then have to use that information as well as we've got the final concentration that they need to be to work out the missing values. So for this experiment, these would be the different values that we'd need to get those concentrations. Then we move on to stage two, which is the investigation, looking at the effect of water potential on osmosis. Now you've got the whole method here, which you can pause and read through. I'm not gonna talk you through it because you can see it and read it. And you could use that, as I said, to come up with a plan for your investigation, making sure you rewrite it in your own words but you don't have to memorize this method for the exam. You need to have an idea about it. So if they gave you a set of information, you could write your own. But the key things are, what I've put in bold is knowing why you do certain steps. So I've highlighted control the temperature, and that is because temperature will affect the amount of kinetic energy and therefore the rate of osmosis. So you have to keep that the same in all of them. They need to be the same length and have the same surface area because again, surface area affects diffusion and osmosis is a type of diffusion. I've put in bold blot the potato chips dry at the start and that is so that any water on the outside of the potato and therefore outside of the cells is absorbed and it won't then affect the initial mass. You then have to record the initial mass and at the end we'll record the final mass and that is so we can work out what was the mass change because any change in mass is due to either gaining or losing water by osmosis. I've also put in bold the percentage change in mass because that is the calculation that we do because turning your change in mass into a percentage change in mass means that you can then have fair comparisons because it takes into account the fact you might not have exactly the same initial masses to begin with. So we can now move on to plotting the data. Here are the results. We've got the different concentrations, the initial mass, the final mass, 
change in mass and then the percentage change in mass. And that is the column that we're going to be using. So I'm going to use that data to create the calibration curve where we're plotting our sucrose concentration in moles per decimeter cubed against the percentage change in mass. And what we would then do is look at where we have zero change in mass because that would then indicate that no water was lost or gained so you must have an isotonic solution. And if the solution is isotonic at that point, it means the concentration of sucrose is the same in the solution as it is in the potato tuber cells. So we now know the concentration of sucrose, and it looks like according to this line, it's just under 0.2. And we would then need to use a conversion table. So you can look these up. You're not expected to know a lot of detail about it. In an exam, just saying this statement would get you the mark. So you use your conversion table to look up the conversion of, let's say that is 0.95 moles per decimeter cubed. We'd look up in the conversion table what that is as a water potential. And we have therefore now successfully achieved what that required practical set out to do, determine the concentration of sucrose, which has the same water potential as the tuber cells. So in this investigation, we're going to be looking at the effect of alcohol concentration on the leakage of pigment leaking through beetroot plasma membranes. So a little bit of background then. Beetroot contains high concentrations of a purple pigment, which is betalin, and that is located within the vacuoles of the plant cells. And betalin cannot cross those plasma membranes if they are undamaged. So the only way that that betalin pigment comes out of the beetroot is if the cells are damaged and therefore the vacuoles are burst open and the pigment is released. So we're going to go through the equipment method results and use that to see how you could determine the effect of alcohol concentration on the leakage of betalin pigment. So here is a suggested equipment list. You would not have to know this off by heart for the exam. It's just to help you with if you are planning the investigation to give you an idea of what you need. And in the method, we'll see how each of these items are used. So for this method, it's split into two steps. First of all, we need to identify the absorbance of light through samples using a colorimeter. So this required practical does use a colorimeter to turn qualitative observations of color into quantitative values which are absorbance of light. And we can then use that quantitative data to create a calibration curve. Stage two is then using that calibration curve to identify the unknown concentrations of betalin released from the beetroot discs after being soaked in different concentrations of alcohol. And therefore, we can see the effect of alcohol on those plasma membranes based on how concentrated that dark beetroot betalin pigment color is and how that is linked to the concentrations on the calibration curve. So let's move then to the method. And stage one is where we're making those color standards to create our first calibration curve. So we're gonna make up these different tubes of solution and these would be our labels to put on them. You could be asked to work out for different concentrations, what volume of beetroot extract and what volume of water would you dilute that in to get the different concentrations? So there's our information, but I'm just going to show you some examples here. So to get these standard concentrations of 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 and also 0%, these are the different volumes that you would need of your beetroot and of your water. If I just go back one, I'm basing this on the fact that we were told that you are making a total of five centimetres cubed. We are told the end concentration that we need to achieve as well. So once we have made these up, each of these different concentrations in these different test tubes will have a different visible intensity of that purple colour. And the higher the concentration of the extract, the more purple it will look. And that will give us our qualitative observations. And we could compare unknowns to those different test tubes to estimate what percentage concentration we have of the extract. But it's going to be more accurate if we have a quantitative comparison. And that is where we then use the colorimeter, putting a sample of each of these extracts into a cuvette, placing it in the colorimeter and working out what the absorbance of light is. So I then went ahead and did that, and we've got for our percentage of our extracts, looking at the absorbance 
of light at the particular wavelength that the colorimeter was set at. This is our results and calibration curve. And this is what we're then later going to use. So the second step of the investigation we need to then do before we can use that first calibration curve. And this is now where we set up our different boiling tubes, putting pieces of our beetroot into the different concentrations of alcohol. So again, I'm not gonna walk, so I'm not gonna go through reading out the entire method. So you can pause it and read it in your own time. Use it if you need to, to write a plan, but put it in your own words. Um, you wouldn't be expected to know this off by heart, but you might need to explain or suggest stages or elements. And that's what I'm gonna focus on. So number one, we've got it set up at a water bath of 30 degrees C. So we're controlling the temperature because temperature affects the permeability of membranes. And we've gone for 30 degrees C because any hotter than that, or any hotter than about 45 or 50 really, would start to cause damage to the proteins within the plasma membrane. And they would denature and cause more pigment to be released. So that's why we're controlling the temperature and that's why it's at 30 degrees C. We're told we have to put a bung on top of all of the test tubes once you put the alcohol in, and that is to prevent evaporation, which if that did occur, it could alter the concentrations that you actually have in your test tubes. We are going to be putting in two discs of beetroot into all five, and that is because we want to make sure that we have the same surface area and amount, so therefore the same potential maximum amount of betalin that could move out. And also we are blotting it dry on the outside to remove excess water, but actually also to remove any of the betalin that's been released through the cutting of the beetroot. And again, put the bung on top straight away, once you've got the beetroot in so no evaporation can occur. We'll leave that for about five minutes, shaking to make sure that there is good mixing with that alcohol and to encourage the release of any of that betalin that might have released from the vacuole. And now we can start to use the results to compare it to our first calibration curve. So here were our original results and the first calibration curve. Now what we've got is my set of results after I've done the experiment and I've placed the solutions that came from the beetroot solutions with those different concentrations of ethanol and the results for the absorbance after it has gone into the colorimeter. Now, one thing I'm just gonna point out at this stage is, you do have to make sure in your tables that you're recording all of your values to either the same number of significant figures or decimal places. And that is not being shown in this instance. So seeing as these all to two decimal places, that should be 0, 0.00, this should be 0 0.90, and this should also be 0, 0.00. Now we've got both of our curves side to side, and we could use this to work out for each of those, percentage concentrations of ethanol, what was the percentage extract of the betalin that came out? So I'm gonna pick 40 just for the sake of it. It could be any of these, you'd need to do it for all of them. But the way we do this is starting with our calibration curve with the different concentrations of alcohol. So I'm gonna start with 40%, reach that calibration curve line, and then read off what was the absorbance. And we can see here, I don't actually have enough scales um, from this Excel graph to be able to do this accurately, but maybe it's around 0.64, 0.65. Um, so then we go to our first color standard calibration curve and draw a line at 0.64, 0.65, see where it hits our calibration curve and read down to see what the percentage extract is. And this is maybe 42%. So that tells us for the 40% concentration of ethanol, we got the equivalent of 42% extract coming out of those discs. So the kind of analysis questions and conclusions you could be asked linked to this practical are, explain why any of these conditions would result in that pigment being released. So a higher temperature would cause the membrane proteins to denature and therefore more pigment would be released. Lipids are soluble in alcohol, so the alcohol will start to dissolve that phospholipid bilayer and cause damage, which again would cause the pigment to be released. If it was in acid, the acid would also cause the membrane proteins to denature and therefore the pigment could be released. So in any of those conditions, you would expect a dark solution, meaning a large amount of pigment had been released. 
So this required practical is AQA's version, but there are similar ones across all the exam boards for A-level. So it's the dissection of either an animal or plant gas exchange or mass transport organ. So I'm going to go through this looking at a sheep's heart, but you may have been given lungs or a fish head or even parts of a plant. But the ideas behind the apparatus and techniques will be applicable to all of them. So the skills that it's testing is can you safely use instruments that you need to use for a dissection? So that will be a scalpel and the dissecting needle in particular. Can you produce scientific drawings of what you are observing? And finally, can you safely use the animal material or it could be plant material to examine their physiological functions? So that's what we're going to focus on in this video. So the aim for the heart dissection is to be able to identify the main blood vessels that you learn in topic three. So looking at the vena cava, the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins and the aorta. Can you identify the valves within the heart? And sometimes this isn't possible because sometimes when you do get hearts from the butchers to be dissected, they've been slashed open and actually cut through the valves. Can you identify the left and the right side of the heart? And finally, the four chambers. Now, you may be given slightly different aims by your school, but I'm going to focus on these ones for now. So you'd need to know what equipment to use. So here's some standard examples of equipment that you would need for a dissection. Now, I said I'm using a sheep's heart example, but it'd be whatever your dissection. You would then perform your dissection on the board and the tray is where you'd have all your equipment. Dissecting instruments. Now, I've just done that generally, but you typically have some scissors. You might have some tweezers. Here we have a dissecting needle and a scalpel. You might be given labels and pins so you can actually pin particular structures that you've identified and then write on the label what structure it is. Plastic gloves don't have to be worn, but you may choose to wear them to prevent the spread of potential infection. And that's also the purpose of the beaker of disinfectant and the disinfectant spray, which you'd be using to clean down the surfaces afterwards. Camera is so that you can record what you've observed and then disposal bags so you can safely dispose of any of the paper towels that have touched the heart, but also the organ itself. So the method then I've split into three sections. Here's the first two. So before you do any dissecting at all, you can identify some of the external structures. So you'd want to take some photos of the outside of the heart so you can identify the coronary arteries. You might be able to try this point here as well. So you can try and locate the aorta and the pulmonary artery and the semilunar valves within them. And if you were to run water through tubing in through the aorta and the pulmonary artery, it will actually cause the semilunar valves to close because you're now creating a higher pressure um, behind that semilunar valve compared to where the ventricles are. Now to open those, you would then squeeze the heart gently and that will then create a more pressure in the ventricle compared to the arteries and that will then open the valves and the water will come back out. So you may or may not have the opportunity to try that. So then you get onto the dissection itself. So first of all you'd make a cut along the side of the heart so you can then look into it and identify the four chambers. So the left and the right atria at the top and the left and right ventricles at the bottom. Once you've done that, you should be able to identify the atrioventricular valves, which are the valves that are found between the atria and the ventricles. And there are these long, thin, white tenderness cords attached to them. So one thing you could try and take a photo of, as well as just feel, is use the dissection needle to slightly pull up on those cords and you'll be able to feel just how strong those tenderness cords are. You should also be able to, by lifting up the tenderness cord, be able to see the valves and you can actually see through them, they're that thin. So it's worthwhile having a look at how thin they are. And if you can document that in a photo so you can annotate that in your write up. 
Next, examine the thickness of the muscular walls of the different chambers. And the key things I'd be noting down are looking at the thickness of the left ventricle muscular wall in comparison to the right and annotate any photos you take to explain why you have a thicker ventricle on the left side. And also comparing the thickness of the walls of the atria compared to the ventricles and again annotating why. Now if you do want to know the reasons why I'll link up here my video on heart structure and function and then you can find out all of those details there. So lastly you may be given dissection pins and labels so you can actually put pins into each four of the chambers and then add a label you might be able to do the same thing with the valves and so on. Now if you don't have that take photos and then add label lines afterwards so you can label the structures in that way. So the final part of the method is how to safely pack away and this is key because one of the things you'll be assessed on is the safe use of equipment but also animal product while you're doing a dissection. So all equipment, dissecting equipment that is, needs to be placed in disinfectant and that's just in case there are any potential pathogens on the organ you've been dissecting that will then kill the pathogens. You should place the heart, the gloves you may have worn and any paper towel that came in contact with the heart into disposal bags, which won't then just go into the classroom bin. They'll be disposed of safely and removed that day. And you also need to clean down your work surface with different disinfectant. Again, just to make sure that if there are any bacteria that may have been on the heart that is harmful, you're removing it. So that's the method. Then you need to consider the risk assessment. And again, always think about what's the hazard risk prevention. And I've picked out two key hazards to discuss here. The first one is if you are dissecting an animal product, the risk is you might end up contracting bacteria or spreading it to other people. And there's a whole range of preventions that need to be put in place to make sure that you aren't going to contaminate the lab or yourself with bacteria. So for example, wearing a lab coat, if you are wearing gloves, safely dispose of them. Same with the paper towels. If you have any cuts on your hands, you must have plasters on those. And I'd suggest wearing gloves as well. Whether you wore gloves or not, you should be washing your hands with a bactericidal hand wash afterwards. All of the instruments should be washed thoroughly with detergent and then disinfectant. The heart, as we said, needs to be wrapped up, placed into a separate bin bag and disposed of that day. And if it's not been disposed of that day, it needs to be wrapped up in the storage bags and then it's placed in the freezer until it's disposed of. And all equipment should be disinfected. Now, the second hazard is the dissection equipment which are very sharp the scalpel scissors if you're using them and the dissection needle so the risk is you could cut yourself now to prevent that you just need to make sure you are handling all of the equipment very very carefully and sensibly so that would cover your risk assessment so finally it's how you'd present your results and this links to again one of the key skills that they were stating that they're going to assess you on and that is scientific drawings. Now you can, and I would recommend that you take photographs as well so that you can then draw label lines and label all the different structures from your photo. And then you can do a scientific drawing either from your photo or it could be from the actual heart that you're observing. It just depends how much time you have in your practical to be able to do this. Now, if you don't quite remember the scientific drawings, what should be included and what shouldn't be, I have got a video which I'll link up here and you can have a look back at how to draw scientifically or biological drawings. But I've just listed below some of the key points. So you have to have a title. So, for example, here I would say heart dissection. There must be a scale. So if you're going to be drawing it exactly the same size as the heart, you'd say to scale. If you've drawn it half the size that the actual half was, then you'd indicate that. It should be drawn with a very sharp pencil, no colouring in or shading. The whole purpose is just to show proportion 
and size. And in the case of the heart, it would be that you're act accurately drawing where the structures are so that you're being able to indicate, for example, the thickness of the ventricle walls, these tenderness cords attached to the atrioventricular valves. We've got the atria up here, the septum and so on. And that's the final point. You need to make sure that you are labeling structures, but any label lines that you do have mustn't overlap or obscure any key parts of your drawing. And for this particular practical, I would suggest that you annotate the functions or explanations as to why there's differences. So for example, here we can see a really, really thick muscular wall. In your annotation, you'd be stating what the structure is. So the left ventricle muscular wall, and then you'd be explaining why that muscular wall is so much thicker than the right ventricle muscular wall. So the aim was to complete two experiments, one on inhibition zones where you have this clear ring around the antibiotics to see which has killed the most bacteria and therefore is the most effective. And then also this streak plating technique as a way to be able to identify and isolate individual colonies which could then be used for further research. And across the two plates, the aim was to have no contaminations. So first of all, in investigating which antibiotic is most effective, but also for the streak plates, within your method, you had to identify how you were going to maintain a septic technique throughout. And that's one of the things you're assessed on. So aseptic technique means working in sterile conditions, and that's to prevent any contaminations of other microbes on your plate but also to prevent you then leaving the lab and infecting others with the bacteria you were inoculating. So there's three steps, pre-inoculation, which is before you add the bacteria to your plate. Inoculating is whilst you are adding the bacteria and post-inoculation is after. So pre-inoculation, you should have only selected sterile equipment or sterilized metal equipment yourself by putting it in the roaring flame of the Bunsen burner. To sterilize the work surfaces, you need to use a disinfectant and you might have had bright pink Vercon. And you have to wash your hands thoroughly with soap to remove any microbes. During the inoculating of your two plates, you should work near the Bunsen burner the entire time. And the reason for that is because you have that flame there, you get these convection currents drawing the air up into the Bunsen burner. As the air passes through that flame, it kills any microbes in the air and you get this constant current sterilizing the air. Um, also with the petri lid, only open it when necessary and only slightly open it at an angle to reduce the chance of any microbes landing on the agar. So post inoculation is then exactly the same as pre. You then have to sterilize all your equipment again because you've deliberately had it touch an E. coli. Sterilize the work surfaces with disinfectant and wash your hands again. So I've got an equipment list here and at the same time we can have a look at the experiment. So I've washed my hands with soap. Then I'm going to sterilize the surface with Vercon. Get the Bunsen burner onto the roaring flame is the next step. Now everything is sterile, I'm going to label the two Petri dishes first. And it's essential that you do label this at the beginning and you need to label it with your initials, the date you have done this and the contents. And that is so that if the plates um, were found by someone else, they know exactly what is in there and how long it's been growing for, um, and that is a serious safety consideration. So I'm going to do the streak plate first. The inoculating loop needs to be at the top of the gas cone, which is the hottest part of the flame, and you can see it's so hot it's going red and sterile. Let the inoculating loop cool down slightly before dipping it in the E. coli. And you notice that I've not put the lid or the open bottle on the bench. Screw the lid on before I put it down. Then working near the Bunsen burner and with the lid um, tilted open, I'm doing my street plate as quickly as possible. Once I'm finished, lid will go on and then sterilize the inoculating loop again to kill the E. coli before I then um, put it onto a surface. 
Last thing, we need to tape the lid on so that it doesn't fall off. Don't tape it the whole way round though, because you want oxygen to be able to get in. So now for the inhibition zone plate, I'm using a sterile one millimeter syringe, which actually I've realized is not on that list. You would need that in the equipment. Um, again, don't put the bottle down on the table. I'm using 0.7 millilitres, placing that on. Um, the syringe, fill up with Vercon to sterilise the inside and out. Then I've got my sterile spreader. And I need to make sure that I evenly spread the E. coli all over the surface of the agar. So you need a nice even lawn of bacteria to grow. So make sure it gets to all of those um, sides of the circle. And then straight into the Vercon to disinfect it. Next I've got my sterile forceps and four antibiotic discs. And we'll use the sterile forceps to pick up the um, discs and then place onto the um, petri dish. Now, if you do drop yours, really you should get another one. But the reason I carried on was I was confident that my workspace was completely sterile because I had just sterilized the work surface. I've then made sure it's completely flat. Lastly, take the lid on again. And that's my second plate done. So that's the two plates. The final thing is the post inoculation sterilization. So I need to then disinfect the whole workspace again. Put everything away in the bin and I'm then using my soap and that was actually hand sanitizer to clean the hands. So that is the method. As I pointed out, you should have goggles the whole time um, and I don't have the um, syringe on that list. So next then is you incubate your two plates. And what that means is leave it at a set temperature so that it then has time to grow. And it's about five to 10 days at 25 degrees C, which is warm enough for the bacteria to grow. Um, any hotter than that is not safe in a school environment because you could get excessive growth. So when it comes to the results, with the streak plate, what you were looking for is, did you get any individual colonies, which are these tiny circles? Now, you might have had bigger circles. If you did, well done, because that's what you were aiming to achieve. The whole point of streak plate is you only dip it into the bacteria once, the inoculating loop, and you're spreading it. And then you can clearly see I've then dragged across the first spread, dragged across the third fourth and I've even gone for a fifth and each time you're spreading the bacteria thinner and thinner so eventually you are able to identify these individual colonies and what you've been asked to do is draw a scientific diagram of this so that we can then see your scientific drawing skills so that's what I'm just doing here for my plate the main thing is you need to make sure you don't have any overlapping lines, sketching, colouring in. You need to label it and make sure your label lines don't overlap either. So there we go. You can see my scientific diagram there um, and just zoomed in again. So that was my plate and here is my scientific drawing. So make sure you've got a title, you've got your labels and you haven't got any overlaps, gaps or shading. It's just to show general position, shape and proportions. So that's the results analysis for the street plate. And on my one, you can see there's no contaminations. A contamination would either be if it's a fungus, you might have a furry part growing. If it's another bacteria, then it'll be a different color compared to this pale yellow, which E. coli is. So if you have a much more vibrant yellow dot or an orange dot anywhere on your plate, unfortunately that is a contamination and you'll need to label that on your scientific drawing um, to identify that you were aware that there is a contamination. The next part would be the inhibition zone. So for this one, you will need to measure the diameter of any inhibition zones you have 
Now to make that easier, I suggest drawing around in a permanent marker. If you've not done that already, maybe have your picture up and um, then create a circle shape on the computer and put that around it, see if that helps. So you need to know the diameter of your inhibition zones. I've included this one here as well, because you can see it much clearer than on my one. So you can really, really see on this one clear inhibition zones. Now there are overlaps, so I would be measuring the diameter up to this point and then all the way around that one. So if you didn't get a chance to measure yours and share the data, not to worry, you can use this set just here. We've got seven pairs, they each plated four antibiotics and they've then put their result for their four. So we have ranging from two results up to five results for different antibiotics. From that, you should then be able to highlight which results for each antibiotic do you think are anomalies, if any at all. And then you'd need to discard them before you calculated the mean and the standard deviation. So I've picked out that these three definitely don't fit the pattern. So zero, zero, and zero, so I've removed those. Now you need to be able to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. So I'm not gonna put those results in. Um, to help you with your analysis of standard deviation, I'll just link a video up here that you can watch. Um, but for my particular year 12s, to calculate the standard deviations, I've um, sent you some guidelines on showing my homework for how to do that. So you'll just need to follow it. So you should end up with a graph a bit like this. We've got mean diameter and I've put the standard deviations on. Um, so from this, we then need to come up with a conclusion. And what we can see is, it's easier for you to do this with a ruler, but you need to look, do any of the standard deviations overlap? And I can see that these two definitely do, and those two do with this one, so those three overlap. Um, even these four overlap, and I think these five just about overlap as well. Now you'll need to get your ruler definitely to check, does this standard deviation overlap? And I think it might only overlap with a few of them. The main thing though is STR was the antibiotic which had the largest inhibition zone. And even with the standard deviation bar on, there is no overlap with any of the other antibiotics. So what that means is our conclusion would be STR is the most effective antibiotic at treating E. coli. The reason being that we um, can see it had the biggest inhibition zone and therefore it killed the most bacteria. That then links to add in your explanation. So the mean was the highest, so it killed the most bacteria and the standard deviation bars didn't overlap with any others. And that's suggesting it is a significant difference. Therefore, it is significantly more effective. Is the evaluation. And by this, what we mean is you've got the conclusion now that STR is the most effective antibiotic for treating or killing E. coli, but you need to consider, are there any parts of your method that make you doubt that? And for me, there were four key parts of the method. Number one, we only tested eight antibiotics. So therefore you can't confidently say STR is the most effective for killing E. coli when you've only tested eight. Number two, we need more repeats to identify the anomalies. Because though I picked out three that seemed pretty obvious, there were still a couple in there that you might have been debating. Is it an anomaly or is it not? And the reason it was hard to tell was there was still not enough repeats to be able to see a clear pattern, particularly for one of the antibiotics when there were only two results. Um, it was only tested on one bacteria. Now, if we are concluding it is the most effective for E. coli, that doesn't actually matter. Um, but if we're trying to conclude it is the most effective antibiotic in general, then you'd need to test it on a range of bacteria. Final thing, if we're going to conclude it's the most effective antibiotic at treating E. coli for humans, then we need to know what the side effects are. Because if it actually causes severe vomiting or headaches, um, then maybe it's not going to be the best choice. So those are some of the considerations. Now in yours, you might need to consider as well any issues about you implementing the method.
particularly if you've got a contamination, this is the part where you need to reflect, where do you think it was that you weren't completely aseptic and how could you improve that? So first of all, just to go through what the aim of this particular required practical is, is to look at the technique of chromatography as a way to investigate the different pigments that you find in different species of leaves. And I've just got an example here of a chromatogram that is complete, where you can see all of these different colored pigments. So although the leaf might only look one particular shade of green, it's actually made up of a combination of different pigments. And that takes us to this background information about it. So chlorophyll is typically five closely related pigments. And if you haven't already watched my video on chlorophyll, I'll link up here so you can find out a full background rather than just this summary. So typically you might have these five different pigments. And each of these pigments absorbs a different wavelength of light and therefore it reflects a different wavelength of light. And that's why they all appear a different colour. Now, the advantage of having this combination of pigments is that each one, as we said, absorbs a different wavelength of light and therefore you get the maximum amount of light energy being absorbed. And different plants will have different combinations of pigments. And that is dependent on the environment they are in, because certain environments will be emitting slightly different wavelengths of visible light. So the hypothesis in this required practical, you might find that you're asked to compare the pigments in two different species of leaves. So our hypothesis would be the combination of pigments and you might be looking at proportion. I'm just going to focus on the pigments itself today. Um, it will differ in the plants depending on their environment. So you might be familiar that some leaves might be more red or purple, or it might be, instead of being reddy and purple, they can be more yellow or a more bluey green colour. So the method that you have to use, number one, you have to be able to extract the pigment from the leaf that you are sampling. And this could either be by just taking the leaf itself and a glass rod and just crushing the leaf onto the chromatography paper. Or if you are going to be following the TLC method, you might then have to crush the leaf in a particular solvent. So you then have the pigment suspended in that solvent. So it's as a liquid. The next step is whichever type of chromatography you're doing, your paper that you're going to be using, you need to draw a pencil line, which will be called the origin line, on your chromatography paper about five millimetres higher than the level of the solvent. And that's so that the solvent is below the pigment dot to start with, so it doesn't dissolve it and just wash it off the paper. Then we can start adding our extracted pigment to the very, very middle of your origin line. And that might be directly you were crushing the leaf with a glass rod onto the origin line. Or if you did make this pigment suspension, then you might be using the tip of a plastic pipette, for example, to take small, small volumes over to your paper, placing it gently on top so you get a very, very small droplet. Whichever method you go for, you'd have to let that drop completely dry and then repeat this over and over because you need to have enough pigment on your chromatography paper that when the pigments do dissolve and separate, they are visible. So approximately, you might need to make your dot about three to five millimeters in diameter. And by the time it's that large, you should have enough pigment. Then once that is fully dry, you will place your chromatography paper or TLC paper into whatever container you're using to hold the solvent and your chromatography paper. But the key thing is you need to make sure that the solvent is just below your origin line and your pigment dot and that the paper is vertically straight, not touching the walls. And that's so that the pigments do run straight up the paper, because if it is at an angle, they'll end up going up 
sideways and they might just run off the end of the paper and then you won't be able to take your measurements later. So you leave this then for the solvent to absorb into the chromatography or TLC paper and it will absorb and move up and as it does that it will dissolve the pigments and whichever pigments are more soluble are going to move further up the paper. And when the solvent is approximately two millimetres from the top use forceps to remove your chromatography paper and you should be using forceps rather than your fingers for your health and safety but also so the grease from your fingers doesn't contaminate your chromatogram so you should end up with something like this you can see your origin line you can see where you had your pigment originally and then the solvent because it dissolved those pigments the pigments have moved up this is tlc this paper we've got the TLC paper and you can see how all of those pigments have separated. Now, as soon as you take your TLC paper or chromatography paper out, you must draw on a line where the solvent is. And the reason for that is when you take it out straight away, it's quite clear where the solvent has gone up to because the paper looks wet, but the solvent will evaporate very, very quickly. And as soon as it's evaporated, you'll no longer know where the solvent front, which is the endpoint, is. And you need that piece of information for the calculation we're going to be doing. So it's essential that you do that. Sometimes, now this one's not essential, but sometimes you might be recommended as well to draw a circle or just draw around the outline of each pigment mark. Because the pigments themselves, the colour does fade with time particularly some of these grey coloured ones, as you can see here, here and here, that colour will fade quite quickly and then you won't have the data to collect. So then we will calculate the RF values, which we'll come to in a minute. And if you are comparing two different leaves, you would then repeat that entire method for your second leaf. So RF values, which stands for retention factor, this is the way that we identify which pigments are present because you could take a guess based on the color you might be looking at the yellows and think well they're yellow so it's xanthophyll these are gray it's phaophytin we've got this one here which is probably chlorophyll b this one's more a bluey green so chlorophyll a however you need to standardize this by actually using an rf value and the RF value is calculated this way. So it's the distance moved by the pigment divided by the distance moved by the solvent. So for example, I've picked out this yellow pigment here to demonstrate. You would need to use your ruler to measure right from the middle of your pigment original um, dot and then up to the middle of the pigment of interest. And we measure from the middle because the pigment is normally quite spread out. So as a way to standardize your measurements, so it's a fair comparison every time, we always measure from the middle of where the pigment has moved to. So that would be our distance moved by the pigment. You also need to measure the distance moved by the solvent. So we measure starting from our origin line up to what we call the solvent front, which is the pencil line you drew on to indicate where the solvent finished. Now the RF values, the reason we use these instead of just looking at the colours is the RF value for each pigment will be constant assuming you're using the same solvent. And the reason for that is each of these pigments has a particular solubility in each solvent. And based on how soluble it is, that is what determines how far it travels up. So you should then be able to look up a database of RF values, look at your calculated answers compared to the database, and then you can record down which pigments you think you have. So once you've done that for your first leaf, you would then do exactly that same method again for your second leaf, and you can then compare whether you think you do or do not have the same pigments in those two leaves. And that's what would take you to the conclusion. So comparing your two chromatograms and the RF values to see 
Do different plant species from different environments contain the same pigments or not? And if they don't, that's something you can start to consider why that might be. So it might be to do with canopy cover, it might be to do with the duration of light, it might be to do with um, where the light's reflecting off, creating different wavelengths of light that are available, and therefore the plant's adapted to have pigments um, that can adapt, absorb those wavelengths better. So some exam questions that have come up in the past linked to this required practical. So we've got number one, why must the origin line be drawn in pencil, not pen? We've got why should you measure the RF value from the middle of the pigment mark? Why should you draw a line where the solvent reached immediately after you've taken your paper out? So why do you draw a line at the solvent front? And why should you make sure your chromatography paper is vertical and straight when you position it in the solvent? So pause the video if you want, have a go at answering those questions. If not, I'm gonna go straight on to the answers now. So the first one, it has to be pencil marks that you're making on your um, chromatography paper or TLC paper because pens contain ink and ink is pigment. So that ink would also dissolve in the solvent and it would run up your chromatography paper and interfere with your chromatogram. Number two down here, why should you draw a line where the solvent reached immediately after taking it out? That's because the solvent evaporates very, very quickly. So the end position or solvent front is not visible shortly after the experiment. So if you haven't drawn that pencil line, you won't be able to calculate your RF values. Why should you measure the RF value from the middle of the pigment? So this is the idea of why should you, when you're measuring the distance the pigment moved, why should you measure the distance the pigment moved right from the middle? And that's because the pigment mark is spread out. It's not one single precise dot. So by measuring from the middle position each time, it's a way to standardize your measurements and therefore you're allowing for these fair comparisons. Last question, why should you make sure your chromatography paper is vertical? And that is so the pigments move straight up the chromatography or TLC paper to avoid them running off the side or being washed off. And that would mean you don't have any results. So we'll go through the aim, background, hypothesis, method, results, conclusion, limitations. Now the method is gonna be very limited. I'm just gonna go through the setup that I would have used and explain each part of the setup. So first then, the aim of the investigation. So the aim of this required practical is to find out what effect the addition of a variable has on the rate of dehydrogenase enzyme in chloroplasts. Now dehydrogenase enzyme is not one of the enzymes on the specification that you need to know in regards to its role in photosynthesis. So this is um, adding in a new enzyme, but it links the idea of how enzymes function, which is part of your theory. The variable that I'm going to be changing is ammonium hydroxide. And that's actually the one that AQA suggests in their required practical handbook. So we're going to be looking at, does adding ammonium hydroxide increase, decrease, or potentially stop the rate of dehydrogenase enzymes? Now, because this enzyme is not on the specification, I'm going to start off with a bit of background about the enzyme, photosynthesis, and some of the chemicals we're going to be using in this reaction. So we'll start with photosynthesis. Photoionization of chlorophyll and photolysis or photolysis of water, both of those reactions occur in the light dependent reaction because they require light energy for those processes or for those reactions. And in both photoionization and photolysis, electrons are released. The dehydrogenase enzyme, which naturally occurs inside of chloroplasts, that enzyme catalyzes reactions involved in the NADP, which is the coenzyme, accepting or picking up those electrons which have been released. Now, the chemical that we're gonna use to be able to track this release and accepting of electrons is DC-PIP. 
And this is a redox indicator, meaning it changes color depending on whether the chemical is oxidized or reduced. So we'll be able to track whether it's picked up or released electrons. And DC pip is blue when it is oxidized and it turns colorless when it is reduced. So when it has picked up electrons, it loses its color. And what DC pip is able to do is pick up the electrons which are released in photoionization and photolysis from the light dependent reaction instead of that coenzyme NADP. So the last bit of background is um, the ammonium hydroxide and that is the variable that we said we're changing. So this is an alkaline solution. So it could be that because it's alkaline, it denatures the dehydrogenase enzyme and therefore it's no longer able to catalyze these reactions. Or it could be that ammonium hydroxide, it also has the ability to accept electrons. So if the ammonium hydroxide picks up the electrons instead of the DC pip or the NADP, the DC pip won't go from this blue color that it is when it's oxidized to being completely colorless when it's reduced. So that's the background information. And from this then, we can come up with our hypothesis. And the hypothesis is a prediction on what we expect to find. So I'm gonna be predicting that the rate of reaction is going to decrease when I add ammonium hydroxide based on what we've just said in the background knowledge. So the method then, what I'm gonna be doing is setting up five test tubes. Only the last two are my experimental tubes where I'll be gaining the evidence or the data to be able to say whether this prediction is correct or not. The other three are to help with the validity of the experiment. So test tube one, I've got all five here already set up, but because you can't actually see the color um, with the angles, I'm gonna show a diagram here as well so you know what is in each tube. So test tube that I've labeled C is my first test tube. And this is my standard. So all that is in that test tube is a chloroplast suspension, which I created by blending spinach in an isolation medium. My isolation medium is a salt solution, which is isotonic. And we're gonna come back to the relevance of that later. So I've just got my chloroplast suspension and distilled water. And the purpose of this test tube is, I'm gonna be looking at these final two to decide when they turn, or the, when the DC pip turns colorless. However, it's not actually going to be a colorless solution in my test tube because there will be DC pip and chloroplast. So when the DC pip goes colorless, what I'll actually be left with is just the green color of chloroplasts. So that's the purpose of this first test tube, test tube C. This is to show me what color just the chloroplasts are. And when these two experimental tubes reach that same color, that is when I'm gonna say I'm at the end point, DC pip has been completely decolorized. So that is my standard for comparison, to try and help with the fact that it is subjective endpoint. I've also got two control experiments and control experiment one, we can see here is covered in foil, which I'm trying to represent here with that gray color. What is actually inside the test tube though, is still the chloroplast suspension, still distilled water, and this time DC pip as well. But the test tube is covered in foil to prevent light from reaching that solution. And the purpose of this control experiment is to prove that DC pip will not decolorize when there isn't light. And therefore it's showing us what we found in our background knowledge. It will be showing us that the electrons are only released when there is light available. So they're released in the light dependent reactions. So we're expecting no color change at all in this test tube and that will prove that light is required. My second control experiment, which is the one just here, as I said, you can't see the color, but it is actually that bright blue color of DC pip. All I have in this one is distilled water again, DC pip, and this time I'm not putting in the chloroplast suspension, because what I'm going to be proving with this control experiment is 
DC PIP does not decolorize unless chloroplasts are present. And that will then show that the dehydrogenase enzyme within the chloroplasts are required. So I'm still gonna add the isolation medium, which was used to make the chloroplast suspension. Again, just so we can show it's not anything within that medium, which is causing the color change. It is just the chloroplasts. So those are my first three, which are to help with the validity. The actual experimental tubes. So experimental tube one, this is the color it looks. And we've got our chloroplast suspension, which is why it's partly green. We've got distilled water and the DC pip. Now the DC pip is bright blue, but because it's mixed with the chloroplast suspension, it's more this teal um, color. So for this one, I'm going to be timing how long it takes um, for this particular color of the chloroplast and the DC pip to go completely green as it is in the standard tube. And that will indicate when the DC pip is turned colorless and therefore the end point of the reaction that we're indicating. Experimental tube two is to prove or to investigate what effect adding ammonium hydroxide has. So we'll have the chloroplast suspension, water, DC pip, but the difference between experimental tube one and two is we're going to add ammonium hydroxide. And as I said, this is to investigate the time taken for the DC pip to decolorize with the ammonium hydroxide. So those are my five test tubes that I'll be setting up. Just to show you how I got that chloroplast suspension. So to homogenize or blend and break open the cells, I used spinach leaves and the isolation medium, which is ice cold and it contains salts to make it isotonic. Once I've homogenized and blended for no more than 15 seconds, I then filter through a muslin cloth. And this stage is to remove large debris. So it could be large cell debris, other organelles. So we're just filtering to just get the isolation medium and the chloroplasts. So then I've got all my test tubes set up and I'm ready to go. So I put them all in an ice cold water bath and have a light source, which is needed because it's the light dependent reaction. At this point, the stop clock will be started and I'm gonna time how long it takes the two experimental tubes to turn exactly the same green color as my test tube C. Now you'll notice that um, I'm turning the tube's position, the test tube position, and that's because I've actually only got one lamp source or light source from the lamp. Um, so there's not actually an equal distribution in that light, which is a limitation. Now at this stage, I'm going to stop the stop clock because I can now see that my test tube X, which was experimental tube one, is now the same color green as test tube C. So that will be the first time that I record. And then I carried on for a further 20 minutes to see if test tube X changed color. And here are the results um, a bit clearer. So the first one I said, it took seven minutes, 44 seconds, and I'll convert that all into seconds. The actual title of the required practical is the investigating the effect on the rate of reaction. And this is just a time taken. To convert it into rate of reaction, you can do one divided by the time taken. My actual results, so as I said, here is comparing the X test tube, which is experimental tube one, with my standard test tube, and I can see they're now exactly the same color. So the DC pip was decolorized, um, and that was the end point of my reaction. Experimental test tube two, this is the start color, it never actually changed. It's still got that dark greeny blue, because it's a mixture of the blue DC pip and the green chloroplast suspension. So this one didn't change color. So I recorded that as no change. And in terms of the rate of reaction, that was zero for rate of reaction. So here's all three of those, just so you can see the comparison. So the first one is the standard test tube to see the color that we're expecting. The middle one is my experimental tube one. And the final one here is experimental tube two. So based on this, my conclusion 
would be that the addition of ammonium hydroxide did decrease the rate of dehydrogenase enzyme activity. You could be asked to consider some limitations. So three limitations I can notice straight away from that is that the endpoint is subjective. I did use a test tube with the chloroplast suspension to try and help with this issue. So I had a standard to compare to. Yet you'd still find if you do this amongst a class of students, they will still all have different opinions of when it is exactly that same color green. So it is still subjective. The only way to overcome this would be to come up with a quantitative measure of the endpoint. And you could do this through the use of a colorimeter. Another limitation was the unequal distribution of light because I was only using that one lamp as my light source. So potentially I could add four lamps. So I've got a light source pointing from four different sides of the water bath reaching all of the different test tubes. Lastly, the way I set it up, the foil was not blocking out all of the light. Some light could be coming in from the top. So you would need to fully cover, including the top, um, with foil. So lastly then, questions that could come up linked to this required practical. So at this stage, pause the video and have a go at these five exam questions. Right, let's go through these then. So the first one, why must all solutions be ice cold? And this is now linking back to your cells topic in year 12. So you'd have to have them ice cold because when you blend that spinach and when you're breaking open or homogenizing the plant cells, you're releasing enzymes that will now be in contact with the chloroplasts, which are naturally in contact. And those enzymes might actually damage the chloroplasts. So by having it ice cold, it will reduce the activity of all those enzymes so they shouldn't be able to damage the chloroplasts. Number two over here, why were the spinach leaves blended? This was to release the chloroplasts. So we're breaking open the cell or homogenizing to release the chloroplasts. Why did you filter the blended spinach? This was to remove the large pieces of cell debris and other organelles. Why must the isolation medium be an isotonic solution? First of all, I just pointed out what isotonic means. So that's when the water potential of the solution is the same as the water potential inside of the chloroplast. The reason that's important is so that we don't have osmosis occurring. because so we don't want water to be moving into the chloroplast, potentially causing it to burst, or water moving out of the chloroplast by osmosis, causing it to shrivel. And then the last one, ammonium hydroxide and other electron accepting chemicals are used as weed killers. And we have to suggest how they may kill weeds. So we've shown in this required practical that when we added ammonium hydroxide, there wasn't any change in the color of DC pip. So therefore we know that the ammonium hydroxide is slowing down or even stopping the light dependent reaction. And if we don't have the light dependent reaction, ATP and NADPH are not being produced. Therefore, if we don't have those two, the light independent reaction, the Calvin cycle, will no longer occur and organic substances such as glucose won't be being made and the plant, in this case, which is our weed, will eventually die. So in summary, um, the photoionization of chlorophyll is occurring during the light dependent reaction and the chlorophyll is emitting those electrons. Photolysis of water is the splitting of water into hydrogen ions, oxygen, and the electrons are the parts that we are interested in this investigation. The dehydrogenase enzyme naturally occurs in chloroplasts, and that is catalyzing the reactions involved in NADP accepting electrons. DC PIP is a redox indicator which picks up electrons from the light dependent reaction instead of NADP. It's blue in color when it's oxidized, but it turns colorless when it's reduced. And measuring the time taken for the DC PIP to decolorize can be used as our dependent variable, measuring the dehydrogenase activity. So we're going to be looking at the use of a respirometer today. 
Um, we're going to go through all of the pieces of equipment here, the purpose of each, and then what we'll be measuring. And it's all to do with changes in volume, and therefore changes in pressure, caused by gases absorbed by whatever living organism is placed inside of this experimental tube. So let's have a look then at the equipment. You would typically have two test tubes. One is there as a control and the other is our experimental tube. And they are attached together by what we call a manometer. And this is this really, really thin capillary tube which has colored liquid inside of it. And against that, there'll be a piece of plastic typically which has a scale on it, like a ruler, so you can measure how far this coloured liquid moves over a period of time. Now, the top of each test tube has to be completely airtight because we're going to be looking at um, changes in gas volume and pressure. So therefore, we have to make sure no gases are entering or leaving. So completely airtight with a bung. We do still have, though, coming out of the bung, a um, capillary tube, which would have a three-way tap. And that's what this label would be, three-way tap. And on the control tube, we also have a syringe. Now, the point of this is you will need to, if you want to do repeats, reset your equipment so you can move the coloured liquid back to the start point, whereby both points are at exactly the same level. And you can do this by either pulling up or pushing down on the syringe to change the volume of gas inside and therefore move the liquid back to the start point. Our experimental tube will have a, a living organism within it that will respire. Now I'm using maggots as the example today, but just as likely you could do this experiment with wood lice or sometimes with plants, in particular peas is a common example, um, fresh peas which should still be respiring. In both test tubes we have soda lime. The purpose of this powder or the granules of soda lime is to absorb any carbon dioxide. So then we'll know any changes in volume are just to do with oxygen being absorbed. For this bit here as well, you'll have a piece of gauze or a metal mesh just to make sure those maggots can't touch the soda lime because it would be harmful um, to their skin. It could be an irritant. So we need to make sure they don't touch that soda lime. Our control tube, exactly the same, except if we want to prove that it's definitely the organism that is respiring and nothing else causing the changes, then we need to put an inert object. So we've got gas, uh, sorry, glass beads here as an example, because they won't be respiring, but you'd put the same mass of glass beads in as maggots just to keep everything consistent. So what we'd then expect is if we have this all set up, then close the taps to make sure it's completely airtight. You then set a timer and look at how far the coloured liquid moves over a set period of time. And what we'd expect to happen is the maggots will be respiring and for aerobic respiration they'll be using up oxygen and that will then mean to replace the oxygen used, oxygen from the gas, the air within the experimental tube will diffuse into the maggots. The maggots will also be producing an equal amount of carbon dioxide as they respire, but that carbon dioxide is going to be absorbed straight into the soda line. So the effect that we'll see is the volume of gas inside of the experimental tube will decrease because the oxygen is moving into the maggots. The carbon dioxide that is produced is absorbed straight away out of the local atmosphere in that tube into the soda line. So if the volume of gas decreases, that will mean the pressure will drop inside of our experimental tube. Now that won't be happening in the control tube because the glass beads aren't taking in any oxygen. So comparatively, the glass beads, um, the control tube here, will have a higher pressure compared to the experimental tube. And because the pressure is comparatively higher in the control tube, that will then force the air around and the liquid inside of the manometer tube and therefore the liquid will start to move towards the experimental tube. So if we left it for five minutes, we might expect to see the liquid has moved around. 
So at the end of that five minutes, what we could then do is work out what was the rate of respiration. And the way to work this out is, it's the volume of oxygen absorbed over a particular period of time for a particular mass of maggots. Now the volume of oxygen, the way we can work that out is the volume of the cylinder for which the oxygen was moving through. So we need to know what is the area of the cross section of the manometer or this capillary tube. And the length is the distance that it traveled. So if we imagine each of these lines was representing five millimeters, for us, it might have moved, if that was the start point, 5, 10, 15 millimetres. So once you've worked out the volume, then you are dividing that by the period of time you left it for. So we said in our example, five minutes. And we also divide it by the mass. And the reason you have to take into account the mass is, so it is a fair comparison. Because if you want to work out the rate of respiration for maggots, you'll end up with a much higher value if you have more maggots present. But that doesn't mean those maggots were respiring faster, it just means there were more of them. So that's why we always have to take into account the mass of the maggots, so it is a fair comparison. So for that reason, the unit is always a three component unit. It's always a unit for volume, per unit time, per unit mass. So for example, it could be centimetres cubed per minute per gram. So here are some example exam questions that you could typically get linked to this practical. And I've split it into the top two are questions about the setup and the method itself. So explaining why the apparatus must be airtight and explain the purpose of the soda line. Then the next one down here is more an application of your knowledge. So you have to use your knowledge of respiration to explain why the liquid would move towards the left. And then the final two are more analysis questions using your math skills. And this one here, three marks for saying what the units would be. That would be your hint to be able to remember that there are three components to the units to include. So have a go, it will take about five to 10 minutes if you do want to pause. If not, keep watching and we're gonna go through those straight away. So number one, why does it have to be airtight? Well, the whole reason the liquid moves is because of pressure changes. And if any gases could enter or exit, then it would mean that the pressure changes are no longer due to the respiring maggots, it's due to another factor. So it's going to affect the movement of the liquid. So that's why we need to make sure it's completely airtight. The purpose of the soda lime is to absorb the carbon dioxide produced. And that's because the volume of oxygen that will be absorbed by the maggots will be equal to the volume of carbon dioxide produced in respiration. So if that carbon dioxide was not absorbed, the volume would always remain constant, the pressure would remain constant, and that liquid would not move and therefore we'd have no way to measure the rate. So it absorbs the carbon dioxide so we are able to actually measure the volume of oxygen absorbed by the maggots and we use the volume of oxygen absorbed to represent the rate of respiration. The next one was explain why the liquid would move to the left. Now sometimes they'll add in an extra question and they'll actually get you to work out which direction would the liquid move first. Um, and it's not always set up the experimental tubes on the left, sometimes it's on the right, but the, the liquid will always move towards the experimental tube. And the reason for that is the maggots are respiring, so they're going to be um, having more oxygen diffuse across their surface for more aerobic respiration. Carbon dioxide, which is produced, will be absorbed by the soda line. So we'll end up with a decrease in volume in the experimental tube. That will cause a decrease in pressure. Comparatively, the control tube has a higher pressure now compared to this lower pressure in the experimental tube. Therefore, it's going to force that liquid, that coloured liquid around towards the experimental tube. So the units, three parts, it's always a unit for volume per unit time, per unit mass. So I've used this as an example, but it could equally be millimetres cubed. Um, most likely it is per minute for this. So if it was per second, um, seconds isn't really long enough to see a change. 
and per grams is the most common because whatever you do put in the experimental tube has to be small enough to fit in a tube so you're going to be measuring measuring it in grams so for this maths question the formula you would need to use to work out the rate is the volume divided by the time taken and the mass and this would be the volume of air the time taken for the liquid to move a certain distance times the mass of the maggots or whichever animal you used. So to work out the volume of air that moved, that is basically the volume of that section of cylinder where we had the movement of the red liquid. And to work out the volume of a cylinder, it's pi r squared times the length. Now in this case, we've been told that the diameter of the tube is three millimeters. So the radius R would be 1.5. And the length is the distance that the liquid moved for this. And that would be 50 millimeters. So the volume of air that has moved into those maggots or into the tube at least that we can confirm is 353.43 millimeters cubed. However, they want you to give this as a rate. So we need to divide by the time taken and also take into account the mass of maggots that we used. And they tell you at the top here that the time taken was five minutes. So we're dividing our answer by five and it was five grams. So divide by five again or five by five divide by 25. Either way, you'll get the same answer, which is 14.13 millimeters cubed per minute because we divided by the five minutes and per gram because we divided by the five grams so that is um our respirometers one of the ways to measure the rate of respiration so just some of the key points to remember the respiring maggots they are absorbing they're taking in that oxygen for respiration the carbon dioxide which is produced is equal to the volume of oxygen taken in but it's absorbed by the soda line that then causes a decrease in volume of the gases and therefore a decrease in pressure of the gases in the experimental tube. Um, because we have that lower pressure in the experimental tube compared to the control tube, that forces the coloured liquid to move towards the experimental tube. Last key point I put down was the units, because this is quite a common either two or three mark question to know the units for rate of respiration. So centimetre cubed or whichever unit of volume. The idea is it has to be cubed per unit time, per unit mass. So first of all, the aim of this investigation is we're looking at whether a named variable, and in this case, I'm gonna go for temperature, has an effect on the rate of um, respiration and AQA specify has to be in a single celled organism, hence we'll be using yeast. So a bit of background then, it's all around the enzyme dehydrogenase. And this naturally occurs in the yeast. And what it does is catalyze the reaction of removing hydrogen from coenzymes and the carbon compounds in the different stages of respiration. Now that hydrogen would normally be picked up by a coenzyme such as NAD, or if it's in the final stage, oxidative phosphorylation, it's actually NADH, which is having the hydrogen removed, and that's then split into the electron for the electron transport chain and the proton for chemiosmosis. So that is how the dehydrogenase enzyme is naturally functioning in the yeast. What we're going to be doing in this investigation, though, to track how quickly that enzyme is um, catalyzing all of these reactions and therefore an indicator of rate of respiration, we're going to add an artificial hydrogen acceptor, and that is TTC. So this is a redox indicator because when it is oxidized, TTC is colorless. When it picks up the hydrogens and becomes reduced, it starts to form a red precipitate. So we'll be able to see a colour change when all of this above is happening. So lastly, we said the variable that we're going to investigate is the effect of temperature on enzymes. Now, this last point is almost identical to required practical one for AQA, because that is what you had to do. Vary one um, independent variable to look at the effect of that on enzyme rates of reactions. So temperature, as it increases, will have more kinetic energy. 
That kinetic energy enables the substrate and the enzymes to move faster. Therefore, it increases the likelihood of successful collisions between those enzymes and substrates. So we'd get more enzyme substrate complexes and therefore the rate of reaction would increase. So based on that background knowledge then, the prediction or hypothesis I'm going to go with is the yeast and TTC, so when we mix those together, will turn red faster, indicating a faster rate of reaction, as the temperature increases. So the way I'm going to um, experiment this is I'm going to use five temperatures and I'm going to use these five here, 20 degrees C, 30, 40, 45, 50. And I'm going to control it by using thermostatic water baths. So setting the temperature of the water um, at five different temperatures in five different water baths. Before starting the experiment, though, I'm going to get two test tubes, one to have a solution of the sugar and yeast and then a separate solution for the TTC. Place that in the water bath for a minimum of five minutes. When the five minutes is up, I'm gonna come back with a thermometer and check the temperature of the two solutions to make sure that they have now reached the temperature of the water bath. Because if we're saying that we are testing um, the rate of reaction at 40 degrees C, let's say, we need to make sure that both of those solutions are at 40 degrees C before we start the reaction. So we'll leave them for a minimum of five minutes before we check to see if they have both equilibrated to the temperature of the water bath. So other things we need to get ready then is a stop clock to measure the time taken. To judge the end point, we said TTC turns red. However, you're unlikely to get that really dark red that we can see at the top of this paint color chart because the yeast solution is a creamy yellowy beige color to start with. So if you mix creamy yellowy beige with red, you actually end up with pink. So I've starred that, this particular shade of pink, to be consistent, I'm going to say when the color reaches that point, that's when I'm going to stop um, timing. So I'm standardizing the method, we'll stop the stop clock at the same end point for all the reactions. I've got a thermometer handy to check my water bath um, and the temperature of the two test tubes is equilibrated. And then I'm going to mix them together. So at this stage I've mixed together the yeast and glucose solution with the TTC and I've quickly taken it out of the water bath just to show you that at the beginning there isn't actually any pink at all. It doesn't match any of those colours. So I'll then start the stopwatch as soon as I've mixed them together, leave the solution in the water bath. Now I did actually use thermostatic ones but because you can't see into them very well I've also done one in a beaker as a water bath so that you can see the colour changes. So at the moment, this is at 30 degrees and it's up to 15 minutes, 36 seconds. And comparing it, it's still not quite at the shade of pink that I have highlighted. So we'd still need to leave it a little bit longer. At the moment, it's somewhere in between these two. So just to show you then, here is the um, whole reaction. So I've mixed together the yeast and glucose, and we have to provide glucose because that is one of the substrates for respiration. The TTC is already in there. Now you'll notice that periodically I'm stirring it, and that's because you can see on the time lapse quite clearly that the yeast does start to settle to the bottom if you don't stir. So we end up with lots of the um, single-celled organism yeast starts to sink towards the bottom, and the sugary solution and TTC will remain at the top. So we need to mix it so that that doesn't occur. Um, I've also taken it out, you can see periodically, just to check against the colour sheet. And that's what you'll keep doing until you've decided that the colour of your solution has matched this. Now for me, as I said, I get to 15 minutes and it's not quite there. Um, I'm going to show you what the final endpoint should look like. So the final endpoint we can see compared to the start colour and the end, this is how pink it did go eventually. Um, it would go more pink than that, but I stopped it when it got to pink Nevada 4. That's the colour that I was using on that pink paint chart. 
So that's our endpoints. When the reaction gets to the point that the solution is always that color, that's standardized our method. So here were my results for each of those. We can see that the time taken did decrease and therefore the rate of reaction decreased as well. Now I did the rate of reaction as a thousand divided by time simply because if I did one divided by time, I ended up with values um, that were 10 to the minus three. So for easier pattern interpretation, I did it as a thousand divided by time. So it's clearer to see the pattern. Now I'm not gonna do a statistic in this video. The statistic you would be doing because we're comparing two continuous variables, increasing temperature, increasing time, you'd be doing Spearman's rank to see is there a correlation, positive or negative, between these two variables. Now if you do want to see how to do that, I'll link my Spearman's rank video up the top here so you can go and have a look. But for now, we're gonna move on. So the conclusion then would be that the rate of reaction did increase as the temperature increases. There were limitations. Even though I used that color chart to standardize the endpoint, it is still subjective. When you did this experiment, I'm sure you found that you had to ask each other, you might have debated a bit, has it reached that color? I'm not sure. So it is still subjective, even though we put measures in to try and standardize it. So ideally, if you could use a colorimeter, that would then give you a quantitative result and remove the subjective nature. There were also issues with being able to see the color change because your samples had to remain in the water bath. So you had to keep taking the test tube out of the water bath in order to see it. And in doing that, the temperature might drop. So there were some issues there. So ideally we'd want to have a see-through thermostatic water bath to be able to see the color change without having to take the test tube out of the water bath. So a couple of questions then that could come up. Um, why must both solutions be left in the water bath for five minutes before the reaction? Why did the TTC turn red? And at which stage of respiration will dehydrogenase be removing hydrogen? So for the first one, we put them in for five minutes so that the yeast and TTC both equilibrate to the test temperature. TTC is turning red because the dehydrogenase naturally occurring within yeast will catalyze the reaction of removing hydrogen from NADH and TTC will then pick up that hydrogen and that reduced the TTC so it goes from its oxidated um, colorless form to its reduced red precipitate. Finally, at which state of respiration will dehydrogenase be removing hydrogen? So NAD is made in glycolysis, link reaction, and the Krebs cycle, so all of those stages, but it's also used in oxidated phosphorylase to remove the hydrogens from all of the reduced coenzymes. So required practical 10 for AQA A-level is this one here, the investigation into the effect of an environmental variable on the movement of an animal using either a choice chamber or a maze. Now I've already done a video on the choice chamber, which I'll link up here so you can go and have a look at that one if you want. This video is just focusing on the method using a maze. Now the theory that this links to is topic six, taxis and kinesis. So you need to have an understanding of this to be able to come up with your hypothesis and explain any of your results. And if you haven't covered this yet, or if you need a recap, I've got a taxis and kinesis video, which again is linked at the top here. So in brief, taxis and kinesis are simple responses and they are there to keep organisms within their favorable conditions. So for example, it could be a wood louse that needs to stay within the dark area so that they don't dry out. It could also be that they need to stay in the dark to avoid predators. It's a very simple response and taxis just means the organism moves its entire body towards the favorable stimulus, or it could be moving away from an unfavorable stimulus. Kinesis is when the organism changes the speed of movement and the rate that it moves direction. So that's the theory that this practical is based on. 
Now I'm gonna be going through the aim, hypothesis, equipment, method, risk assessment, ethics, results, analysis, and conclusion, so that you'd be able to write up a full lab report. And I'm gonna put the time codes at the bottom so you can jump through to go to the bits that are relevant for you, or if you need to know the whole thing, then just stick on and you can see the entire lab report. So the hypothesis and aim to begin with. We're aiming to investigate um, the turning behaviour in invertebrates. And you may be using maggots or wood lice as the two most common um, invertebrates that are used within schools. And in this one, we're going to be looking at their behaviour in response to light and dark conditions. So that is the aim. The hypothesis is what I'm going to predict will happen. Now, I'm going to predict that if we put the wood lice here one at a time at the start point, most of them will take the route that goes towards the dark side. That's because dark is more favourable, because they're less likely to dry out and they're more hidden from predators. So that's my aim and hypothesis. The next step then is looking at the equipment. So you need to create the maze and this image is taken straight from AQA's required practical handbook. So you can um, find that on their website and that gives you a pattern to cut out and use a particular maze. You'll therefore need scissors and glue to create the maze. You need the invertebrates that you're going to use. Um, cotton wool, this is so you can clean the maze in between each trial. Black paper and sellotape to make one side dark. So the method then, step one, create your maze. Then on the dark side, you um, will need to add some black paper so that it is blocking out the light. Step two, now this particular maze can be used for other experiments as well. For the one that we're doing here, just going light or dark side, um, we just need to start here and therefore you need to insert the block at this point so this section of the maze isn't in use. Alternatively, if you are just going to do this method, then you can create a maze that doesn't have that section. So that's now the maze all set up. Now we're ready to do the experiment. So use a teaspoon to carefully add one of your invertebrates into the start point. Then observe and record which side they move to. So do they move along and go to the light or the dark side? Then remove that invertebrate, wipe the maze clean. And the reason you need to do that is they'll leave slight traces of chemicals where they have moved and then future invertebrates that are placed within it can detect that and that will influence their decision. So we just want to make sure it's only the light or dark variable that is having any impact on their decision. You then repeat steps four to six at least nine times with nine different invertebrates so you have enough results to be able to calculate a statistic. And if you do have any invertebrates, when you put them in at the start position, they just don't move, then take them out, wipe the maze with the cotton wool and add a different invertebrate. So that's our method. Now you do also have to set up a control experiment. And the point of a control experiment is to show that any differences that you see are just due to the independent variable. So in this case, to be able to prove that it is just the dark and light that is causing any differences that we see, we'll use the same maze, put the block in, but this time both sides are uncovered. So there is not a dark option. And then after that, the method is exactly the same as it was before. And we would expect that we'll have an equal number of invertebrates going to the left and the right side because the conditions are the same. And this then proves that it is just the light and the dark that is causing any differences that we might see in the test maze. So risk assessment and ethics. The key risk assessment is the fact that we're working with invertebrates. They may have pathogens on them that could cause infection. So that is one of the reasons why we're using the teaspoon to transfer them rather than just picking them up with your hands. And you do need to make sure you wash your hands after the practical. Ethics. Now, whenever you are working with live animals, you have to make sure you are not causing any permanent damage. That is your aim in terms of working ethically with a live animal. And that's another reason we're using the teaspoon, because when you pick them up, you might cause some damage and you can potentially be more careful with a teaspoon. So the results then, when I've done this experiment, here are my results for the control and for the test maze. And as I said, the control maze we would have expected 
to have had exactly half and half. Um, so I used 10 maggots, so I would have expected five in the left, five in the right, didn't quite get that. In my test maze, eight went into the dark and two went into the light. So none of these results were exactly what I expected because I expected all would go to the dark and I'd have 50-50 left and right in my control. However, it might still be a significant difference, but the only way I can conclude that a significantly more went to the dark side is by doing the chi-squared statistic. So that will be part of your analysis. You'll need to calculate the chi-squared statistic. And if you're not sure how to do that, I'll just link up the top here, and then you can have a look at how to use the chi-squared statistic. Once you've then calculated your chi-squared statistic, you can use that to come to a conclusion. And if your statistic shows that there is less than 5% probability that the difference in the number of maggots that went to the dark side compared to the light is due to chance, then we can conclude that the light did cause a significant difference in distribution. So you will perhaps need to look over statistics just to make sure you're clear on that. So at the end of this video, I'll link my maths skills playlist and you can have a look at all the statistics there. So that is the results. The final thing you might get is some exam questions linked to this practical. So I've just picked out four which quite commonly have come up linked to this practical. So the first one, suggest a null hypothesis. Now null would be that you state you don't get the pattern that you're expecting. So in this case, there will be no difference in the number of invertebrates that turn to the light or the dark side of the maze. And whenever you're asked to write a null hypothesis, you have to state both the independent and dependent variable within your null hypothesis. So for mine here, the independent variable is the light and the dark side. That's what I deliberately changed. The dependent variable is what you're measuring, and that is the number of invertebrates which are going to either side. Next question then we've got is, what is the purpose of the control maze? Now, a control experiment is always to show that any differences that you see are due to the independent variable. So in this case, it's to show that any differences in the directions that the invertebrates move is just due to the light and the dark conditions. You could be asked, why do you have to wipe the maze clean with cotton wool in between each trial? And this is, as I was saying, because wood lice, maggots, whichever invertebrates, can leave a trail of chemicals and debris where they've moved, and that can be detected by the future invertebrates, and that could influence their choice, and therefore you don't know if your results that you get are due to the light and the dark, or due to the previous tracks of invertebrates. Finally, why is it important to repeat with at least 10 maggots? And this is so that you have enough data to calculate a mean and more importantly, a statistic. And you need to be able to calculate a statistic so you can say whether the difference you saw is significant or not, um, or whether it was just due to chance. So that is it for required practical 10. I hope you have found it helpful. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. You can see other videos linked to this. And if you do have any questions, send them on the comment section or head over to any of my social media accounts and chat with me there. Hello and welcome to Learn A Level Biology with Miss Estrick. In this video, I'm going to be going through the required practical on choice chambers. So if you are new here, click subscribe so you don't miss out on any videos. So this required practical is looking at the effect of an environmental variable on the movement of animals. And we're going to be focusing just on the choice chamber today. You can use a maze as well in this required practical, but that will come in a later video. So the environmental variable causing an effect on an animal's movement is linking to taxis and kinesis. Now I've actually already covered this in an earlier video, so I'll link that up here so you can go into it in more detail. The key thing you need to know is that they're both very simple responses, which animals have, as a way to move into more favourable conditions. And taxis is when the organism moves its entire body 
towards a favorable condition or away from an unfavorable. Whereas kinesis is when an organism changes the speed of movement and the rate it changes direction. So I'm gonna go through in this video. So in this video, I'm going to go through the full lab report. So the aim, hypothesis, equipment and method, risk assessment and ethics, results, analysis and conclusion. And then at the end, some exam questions so you know how that could link to the exam. So the aim is what we're trying to investigate. And we're investigating the response of invertebrates to light and dark conditions and humid and dry conditions. The hypothesis is what you predict will happen. So I'm going to predict that most of the invertebrates will move into a chamber within the choice chamber, which has the conditions of being dark and humid, because those are more favourable for survival. And we'll go through why at the end of the video in the exam questions. Okay, so the equipment. The main thing is the choice chamber. And this is like a large plastic petri dish and the base is split into chambers it might be split in half or it could be in quarters and the lid has holes in the top where you can insert the invertebrates in and also it provides some airflow now to create a dry chamber we would add silica gel beads and these absorb moisture in the air to create a damp or humid chamber we would insert filter paper which is soaked in water to create a dark chamber, you would cover the plastic in black paper and sellotape it down. We need the invertebrates themselves, and so that you don't touch them, you use a teaspoon to collect them and then insert them in through the hole. So next then is the method. And if you have time in your lesson, ideally you would use four different choice chambers to get the full information. The first one we can see here is empty. And that's so that we can see if, even if you don't change the conditions, do you still get uneven distribution? And um, you should find that you get relatively equal distribution to show that it is due to the independent variables and nothing else. We'll also have one choice chamber set up just investigating dry versus humid, another investigating light versus dark, and this third one here is the one at the bottom, combining the conditions, so dry and light, humid and light, dry and dark, humid and dark. And this here is just going over how you would set up those different chambers, as I said in the previous slide. So once you've created those chambers, the next step is then um, setting up the rest. So you need to have a nylon fabric sheet over the base and then you put the lid on. And the reason for this is we want the invertebrates, whether it's maggots or wood lice, to crawl over the nylon sheet rather than actually going into the base. For two reasons, it's much easier for them to crawl over the sheet rather than going up and down over the different dividers. But also it means they're not going to touch the silica gel beads um, or you might use another chemical to absorb the moisture, which could potentially be harmful. So once we've got that nylon sheet, we then put the lid down and secure it shut. You then would use a teaspoon to insert your invertebrates into the middle hole. So they're right in the center to begin with. And in this case, I'm using 12 because that's what AQA suggests in their handbook. Once you've done that, you leave it for five minutes. You can slightly alter that time depending on your lesson length. And then after that time, take the lid off and you count how many invertebrates are in each of the different chambers. And I recommend taking a picture before you do that because the invertebrates will still be moving and therefore you won't necessarily get the most accurate results. So the other things you need to consider are the risk assessment and ethics. So the risk assessment, the silica beads themselves are inert, so they shouldn't cause any harm. However, because they are um, small spheres, there is a risk of choking if you were to try and ingest them. So sounds obvious, but students should be told, do not eat the beads. Invertebrates, they could have pathogens on them, um, which could cause infection if you were touching them. So that's why we use the teaspoon to transfer them instead of your hands. But you should still also wash your hands after the practical. Now, because we're using living things or organisms in this particular required practical, you do have to consider the ethics as well. 
And the key thing with ethics is whenever you're working with living things, you have to make sure you're not causing permanent damage. So considering things like having an air hole in the lid so that there is plenty of oxygen for the maggots or the wood lice. Being careful with the teaspoon when you're transferring them so you're not damaging their outside. Okay, next is the results. And I'm actually gonna go through what we'd expect first of all before I share with you my results. So the control, we want to show that it is the independent variables that are causing any difference. So we'd expect in the control to have an equal split, six on either side. That might not be the case though, because there is still random chance distribution of those invertebrates. The next one then, dry versus humid, we'd expect there would be more in the humid half, and that's because it would mean um, the maggots or wood lice are less likely to desiccate or dry out, um, losing water from their skin or surface if it was dry. We'd expect more in the dark because, first of all, again, it means they're less likely to desiccate, but also they are more likely to be hidden from predators. And the final one, this is a really important choice chamber because in reality, invertebrates are not just exposed to one environmental variable. Um, it's more likely to be a combination of the different variables. So we would expect this time most to be in the humid and dark chamber. So this is what I actually found when I did this experiment. So seven versus five, two versus 10, one to 11, and then we've got one in the dry and light, two in humid and light, two in dry and dark, seven in the humid and dark. Now, none of these match um, exactly what we might expect, particularly the control. We don't have an exact 50-50 split. But that, as we said, some of these slight variations from what we might expect are due to random chance distribution as well. So what we need to find out is the differences that we see between each of these chambers, is it significant or not? And to work that out, we have to do a statistic. And in this case, it'd be the chi-squared statistic. Now, I'm not actually going to go through that in this video because I have a whole other video on that. So if you need to um, recap how you would do chi-squared, I'll link it at the top and you can go and see the chi-squared video. Now, the point of doing the statistic is to help with your conclusion. And this is so, as we said, you can say if it's significant or not. So if the statistic shows there's less than 5% probability that the difference in the distribution between the two chambers or the four chambers um, are due to chance, then we can put in our conclusion that the different environmental variables in each of these changes, uh, chambers does cause a significant difference in distribution. So finally then, the types of exam questions that you could get linked to this required practical. So you could be asked to suggest a null hypothesis for this investigation, and that is always stating there'd be no pattern. So there will be no difference in the number of invertebrates in the light and dark and the humid and dry chambers, is what you'd need to put for that question. The purpose of the silica beads, the silica gel or the silica beads absorbs the moisture in the atmosphere. And that is how we create this dry chamber environment. The next one, once adding the dampened filter paper to the choice chamber, you should wait five minutes before starting the experiment. So why should you do that? And that is because it provides time for the water, which has been added to the filter paper, to start to evaporate. And that will then create a humid environment in that chamber. And as the water evaporates, it will reach that nylon mesh and it'll be more wet. Next, instead of removing the lid and counting the invertebrates, suggest and explain a different method to improve the accuracy. And this links to what I said earlier. You'd take the lid off, take a photo straight away, and then count the distribution from the photo. Then we have to explain why that is more accurate. And that is because the invertebrates won't have a chance to move around into a different chamber once the lid is removed. So you are getting the exact results um, from each of those chambers before the lid is taken off and light can then go to all of the sections. Last two, explain why most invertebrates move to the dark and humid chamber. So here's a theory question now. So the humid environment is advantageous as it helps to prevent desiccation. 
meaning drying out, so you will have less water evaporating from their surface. But also the dark environment will prevent desiccation and it means that they're going to be less likely to be seen or captured by predators. Lastly, what type of simple behaviour is this experiment demonstrating in the invertebrates? And there is taxis. So it's not kinesis, it's taxis because the organism is moving its whole body towards a favourable condition and away from an unfavourable condition. this required practical we're going to be producing a serial dilution of glucose and use a colorimeter to then create a calibration curve which will be used to identify unknown concentrations of glucose in urine and the link to the spec is the fact that glucose in urine is one of the first indicators of diabetes so for the method you do need this range of equipment but you aren't expected to know that off by heart this is just in case you're planning it so you're going to have um, a range of different equipment to create your glucose standards, your urine samples from person A, B and C, where you're going to be testing to see whether they do have a concentration of glucose in their urine, which would indicate that they are potentially diabetic. Stage one of the method would be preparing a urine sample for testing. So you'd start by labeling your test tubes to indicate which person the sample came from. So you'd have one test tube that said person A, another for person B, another for person C, and you'd add two centimeters cubed of their urine sample. You would then also add two centimeters cubed of Benedict solution. Now we also need to create our glucose standards for our calibration curve. So we're going to set up another six test tubes and those are going to be labelled with the following concentrations that we see in the table and also here in the method. So we then have to actually create those different concentrations and we're going to dilute the glucose standard and our standard is starting at 10 millimoles per decimeters cubed and you would then have to complete this table potentially to say what volume of water and what volume of your 10 millimole standard would you combine to create a two millimole per decimeter cubed solution. And this is where you're using your serial dilutions knowledge and you could use C1 times V1 equals C2 times V2 to work this out, where C1 is your starting concentration, which is 10, V1 is what we're trying to work out, the volume of that standard you transfer over. Our C2 is the concentration you're trying to make, so 2 millimoles per decimeter cubed. And our V2 is the final volume, 2 centimeters cubed. So you could use that formula to work out what volume you need to transfer over, and then the rest of the volume left would be water. And using that formula, you would get these values. So once we've done that, our method would be to put all of the test tubes, so the ones for the colour standard and the ones with the urine samples in, into a water bath for four minutes. And it has to go into a hot water bath because Benedict's doesn't work unless you heat it up. You would then calibrate the colorimeter to be able to test your different samples to get a quantitative value instead of just looking and comparing the colour of the Benedict solution. We'll compare the absorbent so we can turn it into a quantitative value and therefore plot it as a calibration curve. So that's what we've got here, the description of the method of how you would get to that point. So I've got some example data here where we've got the glucose concentration from our standard and the absorbance of light when we place those standards into the colorimeter, so in the cuvettes and then into the colorimeter following the Benedict's test. And that has then been plotted on the graph and we've got this curved line of best fit for our calibration curve. We then see when we did the person A, B and C samples in the cuvettes and the colorimeter, these were the absorbances we got. So you can then read off your y-axis of absorbance, see where it hits your calibration curve, and that will tell you the glucose concentration that they have within their urine. So for example, person B, 0.89, and I've got to say, the way that this scale is, it's not particularly accurate because we don't have all of the fine lines there. So I'm assuming that that's around 0.89, reading off on our calibration curve, that's probably about, um, that's probably about 3.5 millimoles per decimeters cubed. And then you do the same thing for person C, 
Person A, we don't need to do it for because they had an absorbance of zero, which means they had no glucose in their urine. The last thing you'd need to do is you need to look up what levels of glucose in your urine would count as potentially having diabetes. And then you could see whether these two values are over that point. So first of all, recapping from GCSE, it's thinking about why do we actually have to take samples in order to estimate the population size. And the reason for that is if you were asked to count every single daisy in this field here, it would take you absolutely ages and you'd probably make lots of mistakes, either missing daisies or recounting the same daisies. So by using sampling techniques, if you use them properly and follow a selection of rules, it's far more time efficient and often you actually end up with a more accurate answer. So the golden rules are in order to make sure that your samples are accurately representing the population, you would have to in this example here, because it is a uniform distribution of daisies, you would be doing random sampling. And that's to avoid any bias. You're not deliberately just selecting areas to take your samples from. If you had an uneven distribution, and I'll go through examples of that later, then you would use a line transect, and that would be systematic sampling rather than random. But whichever you do, it has to be a large sample to make sure it is representing the population. And AQA typically say large is anything over 30. So just use 30 as your standard answer in an exam. So accurately representing the population is a really common phrase that comes up. Either you could be asked, how do you make sure your samples accurately represent the population? And it'd be random sampling and large samples most of the time. Or you could be asked, why must you take a large number of samples? And in which case it'd be to make sure you are accurately representing the population. So here's just a summary flow diagram to help you work out um, which type of sampling you'd be writing about, writing about in an exam questions. Because so far, the main way that required practical 12 has been assessed in the exams is long answer questions where you are given a scenario and you then have to write the method. And step one, you have to know which type of sampling you are writing the method for. So you have two initial options. Are you sampling the population of motile organisms? And that means organisms which are moving a lot, so most animals. Or are you going to be sampling slow moving like a snail or non-motile like plants or certain um, animals you might find in rock pools that don't move? So depending on which example you've been given in an exam question will let you know whether you are sampling with a quadrat or if you're using the mark release recapture method. Now, that's the end of it for mark release recapture, but for sampling using a quadrat, you then have to work out, are you randomly sampling? And that is only the case if you are given an example in the question where it's uniform distribution. So it could be uniform distribution of daisies in a field or grass in a field, or it might be uneven distribution. So it might be looking at the distribution of animals from the shoreline of the beach all the way back to the sand or the rocky shore and that would be uneven distribution and that would be a line transect. Now in this video I'm only going through quadrats and random and line transects. I'm not doing mark release recapture, that will be in a later video. So a recap on quadrats. You're probably very familiar, they're normally 50 centimetres by 50 centimetres and they can either be open on the inside or gridded to make 100 squares. And if we focus on random sampling first, so we said this is what you would use if it is a plant or a very slow moving animal, and you have evenly distributed plant species. So this could be a four or five mark description of the method, and it's really particular in the mark scheme, the language you use. So step one, you lie two tape measures at a right angle to create a gridded area. And the parts I've put in bold are the bits you would have to have in that answer for just one mark. 
For the second mark, this is where you would then be using a random number generator. So for example, a calculator to generate two values which will act as coordinates. And in this case, I've got the value nine and 11, and you'd need two people to walk and where you meet is where you place your quadrat. So that would be your mark two, random number generator to create two coordinates. Then you place your quadrat. Now for mark number three, you would need to describe either collecting data via density, percentage cover, or local frequency. And it's normally the first two. And the details of that is coming up in a few minutes in this video. The final mark is you would need to repeat steps one to three at least 30 times and calculate a mean. So that's your random sampling method. Now you could have, as I said, a line transect, and this is again if you have slow moving or no movement in your organism, but it's if you have uneven distribution. And common examples are on beaches, so either a sandy shore or a rocky shore, or if you want to see the impact a path is having or a river. So in these two examples, we'd, if we wanted to know the impact of this river on the distribution of these buttercups, you'd need to place your line transect, and then we'd take measurements all the way along to see how the distribution of daisies, the population size, changes in accordance to proximity to the river. Or you might be interested in looking at species richness or the population size of one species going from right here in the rock pools of the shoreline all the way back further up the beach. So line transects, as we said, for when you have this uneven distribution. And the importance of that is it gives you a sample at different sections along the way so you don't miss any key pieces of information. If you did random sampling in either of these, because it's random, by chance, all of your coordinates might end up in this rock pool section and you'd gain no data on the sandy area. Or it could be lots around right by the river and none further away. And that's not going to help you get your answer. The next thing you need to know is the two different types of transects. And you can have a belt transect, which isn't interrupted. And that is when you place your quadrat at every position along the tape measure. Or an interrupted belt transect, which is where you place the quadrat at intervals. Now, you would most often use an interrupted belt transect if you are measuring a very, very long distance because it saves time. Or if at first glance, it looks like if you were to place it every single position, you're not actually going to see much difference. So you might think, that it's more useful to place every five meters or every two meters because you need that distance before you can actually see a difference. So last thing with a transect is the description of the method, which again would be a four to five mark question most likely. And it's this one that students normally give a really vague answer and I'll point out the key marking points which are often missed out. And the first one is a typical mark which is missed out. And that is the precise description of where you place your transect. So if it's on a rocky shore, you have to place your transect at a right angle to the shoreline. And I've just indicated where the shoreline is. So that is where the water is moving up. So that is your shoreline. And this green line that I've put over the top is representing my tape measure at a right angle to that shoreline. So step two and three, this is now where you'd be describing how you would know where to place your quadrats. And you'd either go for the interrupted belt transect, which I have here, or if you're going for every position, then you describe that one. And again, when you place it, you would need to say what type of data are you collecting, density, percentage cover, or local frequency, which is coming up in a few minutes. The last one, again, is repeat by um, another 30 times, or 30 in total, but this is another one where you have to be really precise with how you describe the position of your repeats. So you need to repeat by placing at least another 30 transects along the beach, but again, you have to emphasize at right angles to the shoreline. So I fitted on here another three repeats, 
you need to ideally have 30 going all the way along that beach at right angles to the shoreline. So the final thing then is how you know which method you're going to use to count or collect the data inside of the quadrat. And I'm going to go through three key methods. So number one, local frequency. This is where you are counting the number of squares um, which have the species present. But because we have 100 squares, we represent it as a percentage. So I've already put on this diagram in blue all of the squares out of the 100 where the plant species is occupy, occupying part of a square. And that is 35 squares in this example. So we would say that when we place this quadrat down, we'd be recording 35% is the local frequency of this quadrat. You would then repeat 30 times, calculate a mean, and whatever the percentage is, you would use as your estimate for the entire field. The next option is density. And you would normally use an open quadrat for this. And this is where you're counting the number of one species in a given area. Um, and you're counting the actual number. So in this example, I've counted there are 11. And we need to know how many we have in the entire field. So there is a bit of maths involved in this one. So if we have 11 in a quadrat, which is 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters, that is 11 in 0.25 meter squared area. However, the size of the field in this example is 280 meters squared. So we then need to work out how many there would be in the entire field. So to do this, step one is working out how many times does your quadrat fit into the size of the field. So the size of the field is 280 divided by the size of the area of the quadrat. And we know there are 11 in the area of the quadrat, so that's why I did multiply by 11. So in this example, in the entire field, there's 12,320 daisies. That is our estimate. Now with density, again, you would have to have done 30 repeats, calculated a mean, and then you would do this sum. Final method is the percentage cover. And this one is where you would have to estimate how many full squares out of the 100 are completely covered by the daisy. And to be able to do that, you have to be able to visualize and estimate if you were to squash all of those plants together, how many full squares are covered. So it is quite tricky. Sometimes people do this by tearing up pieces of paper um, over the actual plants, and then they put all of the paper together to try and make this easier. So you're not doing it visually in your mind, you're actually using pieces of paper. And from this, I estimated there are about 18 full squares covered. So my percentage cover would be 18%. Now, just having a look at these, each time I've used exactly the same data. So I've used exactly the same position and number of daisies. And we have very different answers for percentage cover and local frequency. So that's the final thing I'm going to go through is the pros and cons of these three methods. So you know when to use each one, because that's another thing you could be asked for required practical 12 is which method would be most appropriate for the example they've given you. So local frequency, the advantages are it's very quick. You're just looking at how many of the squares is the plant present in. So it's a useful one to use if you need to survey a large area very quickly. It's also useful if the plant species that you are surveying is too difficult to identify as an individual species. So for example, moss, you can't really tell where one moss plant starts and where one ends. Or if there are too many to count, for example, grass, you couldn't count all of the grass species in a field. Instead, this could be a good alternative. The downside, poor accuracy. And the two key reasons for that is number one, it doesn't take into account that in this section here, we actually have plant species overlapping. And it looks like there's four there, but there might be more underneath. We might have many other daisies overlapping, so you can't count them. 
The other example is if the plant that you're counting is very, very big and one plant, so one individual, might occupy almost the entire quadrat and that would give you a really high percentage local frequency even though the population size might actually be very small. So it can be misleading depending on the size of the plant. So the next one, density. This is more accurate in comparison, but it's only more accurate if you can easily distinguish an individual plant and there's not too many to count. So daisies is actually a good example to, um, of a plant species to use for density. You can also use this method if you are asked to estimate the species richness, which is how many species there are, how many different species there are in a given area at a given time. So in that case, you'd just be counting how many different species there are in your quadrat. The downside is it is more time consuming. So lastly, percentage cover. So it is quicker than density and it's more useful than density if you are going to find it too difficult to identify an individual organism or there's too many to count. So it does have its place. The downside is it's subjective. So I looked at that and said it was 18%. You might have looked at it and thought, well, no, I don't agree. I think that's 20%. So you do get, because it is your opinion and your estimate, it is subjective and that limits the accuracy. Again, it doesn't take into account overlapping plants and the size of the plant. So those are the four parts of this particular lesson, and it links to what the specification states you need to know about this method. So just a reminder, if you haven't already watched my first sampling video, then you can link to it just here. But this is the sampling method that you would use to estimate the population size of motile organisms or moving, the faster moving animals. So step one then, let's have a look at the method. So as I just said, this is the method of sampling you would use if you needed to work out how large a population of a particular animal was. So butterflies, different bird species, for example. So the first thing you have to do, as the name of the method suggests, is capture an initial sample and you mark them. So the sorts of ways you might be capturing them would have to be ethical, so you're not causing any harm. It might be little pitfall traps, which is what this diagram here is showing. So insects can crawl in, um, but they can't crawl out. And this shield here is to prevent excess water from dripping in if it rains so they don't drown. Or for other animals, it can be larger box traps, which shut when they enter and there's food and water provided inside for them. So that's step one. You need to capture an initial population. So you'd leave your trap set up for a period of time. You come back and then the individuals that you have captured, you would mark them in an ethical way, which we'll come to in the ethics section. And the mark that you put on has to be all weather resistant. So it has to be something that is not going to wash off in the rain, for example. So once you've done that, you then release those animals safely back into the wild and record how many you had captured. So that is the mark release part of the method. The next step is you need to leave those animals that you've released for a long enough period of time so that they should be able to randomly disperse amongst their natural habitats. And that period of time will vary for each animal because it depends how quickly they move. Once you've left them for that period of time, you then set the traps up again and you capture a second sample. This time though, you don't mark any individuals. We are just recapturing and you will need to collect certain data. So the data you need to collect is the total number that you have captured in your second sample. So you'd record that number down. You also need to record down from that sample how many of them are animals that were already caught, which you know because they are marked in some way. So you are recapturing, counting the total number in your sample, and within that sample, counting how many have the marking on. You're then gonna use this data in the calculation 
to come up with an estimate for the size of the entire population. So this is the sampling technique. You're not counting every single animal in the population because you won't necessarily find them all. Instead, you are taking samples and we're gonna use this calculation as an estimate. Now that is just one round of this method. If you were to repeat this over and over and over and over and to calculate a mean, you would get more accurate and reliable results. So you should do multiple repeats. So the calculation then, let's have a look at how we'd actually use that data. You do need to know this calculation for AQA, for A-level. They wouldn't provide you with this. And in an exam question where it might be a long answer question, and they ask you to describe and explain the method, there would be one mark just for stating this equation. So to calculate your population estimate, this is how we then use all the values we collected. The number of organisms that you initially caught, um, and then that would be multiplied by the number of organisms in the second sample that you caught, divided by the number of marked organisms recaptured. So just to go through an example, let's say I've been sampling a particular butterfly species. In my initial capture, I caught 20 butterflies and I marked all of them. I then released them, allowed them to redistribute equally. And then I took a second sample, and this time I captured or re, uh, captured 22 butterflies, but I recaptured nine because out of those 22, nine were marked. So that would mean I'd be doing the number of organisms initially caught, which was 20, multiplied by the number of organisms in the second sample, which was 22, divided by the number of marked organisms recaptured, which is nine. So in this example, my sampling mark release recapture method would give me an estimate of 48.89. But because we're talking about animals, you do have to round up or round down. So I'm going to be rounding up in this case, and I'd be estimating that in that particular habitat, there are 49 of that butterfly species. Um, so that would be our estimate of the population. So thinking about the ethics, this is a key thing with sampling animals. So the main thing you need to be aware of is not exact techniques of how to be ethical because you would have to know so many different methods, it'd be too extensive. What you have to know though is that whichever method is chosen to capture and to mark the animal, has to be ethical and what we mean by that is it has to be a method that causes no permanent harm or pain to the animals so if you were asked how to sample uh, or how to capture bees ethically that did come up in one of the exam questions you don't have to give an exact technique of how you do it you would just say you would choose a method that causes no permanent harm so that's how you'd capture them ethically for the mark, there is a bit more detail of what you'd need to say when you consider how you tag the animal or mark them. So number one, if you're going to be painting on a tag, so we can see that on this butterfly, they've painted on a particular number as a tag. The paint that you use has to be non-toxic. It has to be all weather resistant as well, but that's not ethics, that's practicalities. You also have to make sure that the paint that you're adding on, or if it is a physical tag, like this one around the bird's um, leg, it must not increase their chances of predation. So it can't be some bright colour that will then interrupt with their camouflage, for example. It also must not reduce their chances of reproduction. So it shouldn't interfere with their courtship ritual. Other things to consider, so this tag here on the bird isn't interrupting their ability to fly. So you've got to make sure that whatever you are doing to mark the animal, it's not toxic, it's not going to harm them, doesn't interfere with reproduction, and it doesn't make them more obvious to predators. So the last thing you need to know about the mark, release, recapture method is the assumptions. And what we mean by that is the calculation is based on some assumptions. And because of that, you'll often find that when you do a model of this practical, which is going to be my next video with Skittles, you will find that your estimate might not actually be very accurate. And that is because of these two key ideas. 
So when you're doing the mark release recapture method and you are performing that calculation, there is the assumption that the population size is constant. And for it to be constant, that means there has to be no new births, no deaths, and no migration of any kind. And realistically, that is not happening in any population. The second point is we assume that when we leave the animals for that period of time to redistribute, that they do actually redistribute evenly. So when you are then collecting your sample, you are getting um, an equal distribution um, and representing the population accurately. However, that's not always the case. Often animals will not redistribute evenly and instead all the animals will huddle in one particular area. And that might be because it's near a food source, it might be near a water source, it might be just a location that provides better shelter from the weather or from predators. And that's what we can see here, our little ducklings, they're all huddling close to the um, lake or the river because that's where they're going to have their water source and their food source. So those assumptions are the reasons why the estimate that you get from this method is not always that accurate. So where this actually comes up with the practicals is in two of the required practicals. Required practical three is linked to using a dilution series to create different concentrations of a solution to investigate the water potential of plant tissues. And required practical 11 is creating dilution series of different glucose um, concentration solutions to so then using a colorimeter. So first of all, what do we actually mean by dilution series or serial dilution? And this is when you are doing step by step dilutions to create a range of different concentrations. So if we have a look at this example, this test tube is what we call in the stock solution. That is your original concentration in your original solution. And for this example, I'm just saying that is 100%. What you then do is step by step dilute to create a range of concentrations. So first of all, I'm going to take one part of the stock solution and mix that with nine parts water. And then doing that one to nine ratio, we've now diluted it tenfold. So we've gone from 100% to now a 10% concentration. And we continue to do this step by step. So if we repeat that process, we'll then end up with a 1% concentration. Repeat it again, we'll then have 0.1% concentration. And in between each time, you do have to mix it thoroughly. Now, the reason that this is an advantage is it enables you to make solutions with very low concentrations, such as this 0.1% concentration, but you don't have to measure out very small volumes. Each time you're only measuring um, one part could be one centimetre cubed. So it could just be one centimetre cubed and nine centimetres cubed. And you can do that accurately than if you were trying to measure out very precise or very small volumes for example, 0.99 centimetres cubed to make one of these very small concentrations. So that's why it's an advantage. It improves your accuracy. So I've got an example practical question here. So we've got the student needed to estimate the number of bacterial cells present in a solution by counting them under the microscope. They needed to use a dilution series to investigate the number of cells present, otherwise there'd be too many bacteria to accurately count. So the actual question is describe a method for how they could make a 1 in 10 dilution and then use that solution to make a 1 in 1000 um, from that original solution. So this is now going to show you how you would use the information from the slide before to fit this exam question. So the first mark would be add one part bacteria culture to nine parts water. And that is what I was showing you on the previous slide. So you'd add one part to nine water and that would make your one in um, 10 dilution or 10 to the minus one. 
there's always a mark for saying mix at this stage because you have to make sure that the one part bacterial culture and water are thoroughly mixed so you do have an even distribution and you have equal concentration throughout that test tube. Then it's just repeating this twice over. So you would then take one part of the 10 in one and mix that with nine of water, mix it up, you would then take one part of that 10 in 2, or 10 to the minus 2, um, with nine parts water, mix it up, and that is how you get your 10 to the minus 3, or in other words, 1 in 1,000. So that is typically a three-mark question, and those are the key marking points. So that's how this links to the practical skill. You can also be assessed, though, mathematically with dilution series. And there's two key, very basic formula that you can use to really, really help you with these questions. So first of all, C1 times V1 equals C2 times V2. Now C1 is the concentration that you start with, so that is often called the stock solution. V1 is the volume of the stock solution that you are transferring over. C2 is the concentration of the solution you're making. V2 is the volume of the new solution. Now the second formula down here is showing you what V2, so the final volume, uh, what that is actually consisting of. So it's V1, so it's the volume of the stock solution you're transferring over, plus the water, the volume of water that you're going to be diluting it with. And you will often need both of these formula to complete an exam question. And I think that's often why students find these questions hard, because they just use that top formula. So here's an example of how you could apply the formula to one of these maths questions. And quite typically, you'll see that you'll be given a table and you will then be asked to populate the missing sections. So in this question, the table below shows how to make sucrose solution with a concentration of 0.08 moles per decimeter cubed. So you have to complete the table, filling in the missing heading, which will go here, the units, which will be here, and then these two volumes at the bottom. So first of all, let's put this here as our reminder, those two formula to use. And the first thing you should do on these questions is highlight all of the numerical values you've been given and look carefully because often you'll have some of the numerical values that you need to use actually within the table even within the header here and this is a very similar question that came up to one um, in 2018 or 2019 and lots of students didn't get this mark because they missed the value in the table now once you've highlighted all the values, then you need to apply your knowledge from the um, formula to work out which values you've been given. So we have C2, so this is the concentration that we need to make, so that's C2. We're told this is the volume that needs to be made, so that's V2. And this is actually C1, so volume of the one molar per decimeter cubed sucrose solution. So we need to work out the volume that we need to use, but you're told that that is the original solution. So we need to work out V1 for that box. So first thing I've done is rearrange the formula. Then I've slotted in our C2 and V2 and C1, and that has now given us 1.6 centimetres cubed. Now we needed to fill in this section here, what is the missing heading? And this is where the second formula comes in. So we've already worked out all of the values from the first formula, but what we haven't worked out yet was the volume of distilled water that we have to dilute V1 in. So that's what was missing in this table, the volume of distilled water to dilute with. And because it's a volume, we're gonna match the same units that they used here, centimeters cubed, and use those. Now it's time to use the second formula to work out what is the volume of distilled water that we need to use. So I've rearranged the formula because this one here is as V2 as the subject, um, but we want distilled water to be the subject of the formula to work out the volume we need. So V2 minus V1, 18.4 centimeters cubed. Now you don't actually have to put the units with in the body here if they're in the header so just bear that in mind so in this session we're going through how you can actually measure the rate 
of uptake of water to be a representation of the rate of transpiration. So it's using this piece of equipment, which is called a potometer. And what potometers measure is how much water a particular piece of plant is taking up in a period of time. Now, the reason that it's measuring uptake of water rather than transpiration is because it's near impossible to measure the rate of transpiration. And that's because it's water vapor that is coming out because it's evaporation. So it's very difficult to measure that. So instead, because the amount of water that is taken up is almost the same as the amount of water which evaporates by transpiration, we take it to be that however much water was taken up is proportional to the rate of transpiration. So that's what it's measuring. The uses are, you could just use it to see the rate of transpiration for one particular plant and compare that to a different plant species, or it could be the same plant, but looking at the effect of those four variables that we said have an impact. So light intensity, air movement, humidity, and temperature. So looking at how it's set up. So the first thing is you need to get your sample of plant into the potometer. And you tend to just cut off a small section, which you can see in this diagram from the main plant. And when you cut it, it has to be cut underwater. And the reason for that is the xylem has negative pressure, meaning it's constantly pulling up the water from lower down. So if you were to cut the plant in the air, it's going to be pulling air into the xylem. And that will then break the continuous column of water and you won't have transpiration working, or at least it won't work very efficiently. So we cut it underwater to make sure only water is being drawn into the xylem. The next step is the potometer equipment all needs to be filled with water. And again, this is done completely submerged in water, and that's to make sure all air bubbles are removed. We then get um, that leafy part of the plant is put into the potometer through a rubber seal, like a rubber bung. And all of the sections where there is a joint gets covered in petroleum jelly to make the equipment completely airtight. And that's to make sure no air bubbles can get in, which would prevent the flow of water, but also to make sure no water can leak out and therefore affect the accuracy of the measure of the uptake of water. The final thing in terms of the setup is one single bubble does have to deliberately be introduced. And the way that is introduced is at this end here. Now this capillary tube will be lifted out of the water probably for about five, 10 seconds and then placed back into the water. And that five, 10 second gap will be enough time for some air to be drawn in to create that one air bubble. And the point of that is, when that air bubble reaches zero on the scale on your capillary tube, you can then start your stop clock, and then you can see how far that air bubble travels in a certain period of time. So these measurements um, are used for you to see how much water is taken up and the way you're getting that idea is you're looking at how far that air bubble moves so this water is continuously moving towards the plant because as that plant is transpiring more water is drawn up into the plant so to convert this into an estimate of transpiration, the rate, the distance of that bubble has moved um, can be used to work out the volume of water. So you would need to know the volume of a cylinder to be able to work out the volume of water that has moved. And then you would tie, sorry, divide that by the time it took for that water to travel. And you can reset the apparatus, and that is the purpose of this reservoir of water. And this tap is closed when you're doing the experiment. But if you open this tap, 
that allows water from this reservoir to move into the capillary tube and it then pushes that air bubble and you can leave it flowing so it pushes the air bubble all the way out or just back to the start then close the tap and restart the experiment so you can get multiple repeats so that's how you would use a potometer just to check the understanding then i've got four exam questions which are quite common linked to the use of potometers so we'll go through them one at a time if you want to have a go at them first just pause the video now have a go at those four questions and then press play and continue at that point so the first one was explain why the apparatus must be set up and the plant shoot must be cut underwater so this is what I was saying, it's due to that cohesion tension theory, it creates a negative pressure in the xylem, so it's constantly pulling up the water. So if it was, so that should say was there, so if it was cut in the air, it would draw air into the xylem instead, and that would break that continuous water column and prevent transpiration. So instead you have to cut it underwater to make sure no air bubbles are introduced into the xylem. The next one, um, why must all the joints in the apparatus be covered in petroleum jelly? First thing is just pointing out, petroleum jelly is waterproof. So by covering all of these joints in this waterproof substance, it makes sure that no air can be introduced into the apparatus, but also makes sure that no water can leak out, which would impact your accuracy of your estimate of water taken up. So the common maths question is to work out the volume of water taken up um, to represent transpiration. And to work that out, because it's a rate, you need to know the volume of water that has been taken up by the plant. And that would be divided by the time it took for that quantity of water to be taken up. So here are the figures that we're given in this example. The air bubble has moved 15.28 millimetres in one minute. So they left it for one minute and that air bubble has moved 15.28 millimetres along that scale. The next piece of information is the radius of that capillary tube is 0.5 millimetres. So using that information, we can work out the volume. And because it's a rate, it'd be the volume divided by time taken. It was only one minute, so it would only be divided by one. So essentially, we just need to work out the volume. So to work out the volume of a cylinder, it's pi r squared times l, which is the length or the distance that the air bubble moved. Now we're just going to assume that pi is 3.142 in this example. So we can then put in the data. So we've got pi, 0.5 squared, and the length or the distance was 15.28 multiply all of those and it comes to 12 so that's 12 millimeters per minute sometimes you might be asked to do a conversion they might ask you to convert that to a different unit so maybe centimeters instead of millimeters and per minute perhaps they might ask you to convert it to seconds or hours so the last question is what variables would have to be controlled if you were to perform this experiment on two different plant species? So you're examining, is there a difference between the rate of transpiration on those two different plant species? And the key variable that has to be controlled is the surface area of the leaves. So you need to make sure there's the same number and the same size leaves so that's a fair comparison. Now, one of the key things that students thought when this was introduced to the A-level and the GCSE specifications was why are we being asked to do drawings or critique drawings in a biology exam? And the reason for this skill is to improve observation skills. Now, for some experiments, you might be recording data which is numerical. But in other experiments, like we can see here, growing bacteria in a Petri dish, the observation is more visual. And the best way to record those observations is with a diagram. So the drawing is to assess whether you can really observe your specimen closely to then draw it accurately. And can you use your knowledge to demonstrate what are the key important features of what you're observing? Because you don't literally need to include every single part of this diagram and all of these small tiny dots. You just need to be able to demonstrate the key structures so that you are able to show the key points. 
Also, it's so that you can show that you can label and annotate the diagram as well, which also demonstrates your knowledge. So how do you draw biologically then? It is completely different to an artistic diagram. So that's the first thing to be aware. This is not artistic. What you need to include are these six points whenever you do a biological drawing. So number one, you have to title your drawing. Now I have got one here, but it's very faint, so you might not be able to see it. I've got their scientific drawing of a street plate, and I've also got the date there. You have to always indicate the scale, or it's if it's a diagram from under the microscope, you need to state what magnification it was. All the diagrams have to be drawn in pencil, and they should be sharp as well, so that you can then accurately draw any precise details. There is no colouring or shading. So we can see here the actual E. coli that I grew on this plate was pale yellow, but I've not coloured this in or shaded it, it's just left as the outlines. And that's because the point of these diagrams is just to show shape and proportion. So for that reason, number five, you have to make sure that what you have drawn is similar to what you've observed. So by that, I mean, is it the same size? Is it the same proportions? Those all have to be accurate. And lastly, you might be asked to label key structures. So that is testing your knowledge. But what you need to make sure of is the lines that you are drawing, they need to literally touch what it is you're referring to. So we can see here, that is the E. coli, that is the agar. And you need to make sure that your label lines do not cross over other label lines and make sure they're not obscuring key parts of your diagram. So those are your six key tips of how to draw biologically. Let's have a look at an example. So this is similar to an exam question that has previously come up. So you could be given a micrograph, which is an image from under the microscope, and be asked to draw what you've seen. So draw the mitochondrion from the micrograph and label two key structures. Now it's likely for this that three of the marks will be for the quality of your drawing and only one of the mark will be for correctly labelling the two key structures. So here's an example of an answer that a student might have given here. So within the box they've got their diagram, we can see they've got the title, they've copied over that scale which they were given, They've labelled four key structures, so they haven't just gone for two, they've gone for four, and they've made sure that the label lines do not overlap. Now, if we compare that to the mark scheme, we can see that they have got all of those marks. The magnification was indicated. There is no colouring or shading, even though we can see in the micrograph there were darker sections. They have just given the outline. The mitochondrion that is drawn is the same size and it does look relatively similar, so that would count as being accurately drawn. And we have got at least two key structures labelled. And in the mark scheme, they said, for example, they have to give the Christi or the outer membrane, but they've gone for additional ones as well. And the label lines do not overlap. So that's one way that this could be assessed within the exam. You have to do the drawing. Alternatively, you could be given the drawing and the original micrograph and you are then asked to suggest two improvements to that biological diagram. So for example, we've got almost the same diagram, but this time we can see the label lines do overlap in multiple places. They have shaded in some of the structures. They have got a title and it is to scale the diagram, but they haven't actually stated the magnification. So for two improvements, any of these answers would have got you a mark. So the magnification should have been stated. There should be no shading and the label lines should not overlap. Magnification is one of the math skills linked to microscopes and it's used with optical microscope images. So the formula, again, straight from GCSE, Image size equals actual size times magnification. Now I've deliberately written it this way rather than as the magnification formula because I think this is the easiest way to remember it. I am. So I being image, A is the actual, M is the magnification. And then once you can remember I am, you can rearrange the formula to work out magnification or actual size. 
Now that is um, a skill from GCSE Maths, but if you can't remember that, I'll link up the top here. Just click to see one of the GCSE videos I have on rearranging the formula, just to recap to get your A-level math skills up scratch. So the other thing that you'll need to be able to do is one of the math skills is converting units. And that's because your image size, so this is when you're going to be measuring your microscope image, which is also called a micrograph, um, you'll be using a millimetre ruler. So your image size will be recorded in millimetres. The actual size of cells and organelles is much smaller. It's going to be in micrometres. And in order to use this formula, you have to have both of those sizes in the same unit. So if you have recorded your image size in millimetre, then you'll need to convert it into micrometres so you have the same units. So to go from millimetres to micrometres, you multiply however many millimetres you have by a thousand. So if you measured two millimetres, that means you have 2,000 micrometres. Or you could do the conversion the other way around. If your actual size is in micrometres, you can convert your image size into micrometres as well. And in which case, if you had 2,000 micrometres, to convert that back into millimetres, that would be divided by 1,000 and you have 2 millimetres. So just to go through a worked example, We've got here, it's a bit blurry, but I'll put in all the details. You could be asked to work out what is the magnification of this micrograph image. And they've given you a scale bar. And if you're shown a scale bar, what that means is the length of that bar is representing an actual size of 50 micrometers on this image. So our scale bar is the actual size, and that is 50 micrometers. What you then need to do to work out the magnification, we know to need to know the image size. And you don't need to measure any cells for this. You are measuring what is the image size of that scale bar. So you'd line up your ruler and measure how many millimetres long your scale bar is. And in this example, it's 20 millimetres when I measured it. So now we know we'd be doing our image size, which is 20 millimetres, divided by our actual size of the scale bar, which is 50 micrometers, but we need to get those into the same units. So I'm gonna convert 20 millimeters into the micrometer units to match the scale bar. So I need to do 20 times 1,000. So that gives me 20,000. That is our image size, divided by our actual size is 50, so our magnification of this image is 400 times magnification. So finally, the last skill is the use of an eyepiece graticule and how you calibrate it. So I'm just going to show this image here of the microscope first of all, just so you can see where the eyepiece graticule is located. So this eyepiece graticule is a glass disc which is within the eyepiece. And that glass disc has a scale scratched or etched onto it. And that is so you can line it up on top of whatever you're visualizing to see how many divisions on your eyepiece graticule does the nucleus cover, for example. And that can then be used to measure the size, the actual size of the objects that you're viewing under the microscope, rather than using the formula that we saw on the previous slide. However, it's not quite as straightforward as that because as you're using your um, light microscope, you will be potentially moving between these different objective lenses and each lens is a different magnification. And what that means is the divisions on this eyepiece graticule scale will be worth different distances depending on how magnified the image is. And that's why we have to calibrate the eyepiece graticule each time we use it at a new magnification. So to calibrate it, you need to use a second scale, which is called a stage micrometer. And this is a glass slide. It looks quite like a um, glass microscope slide. And it's called a stage micrometer because this is the scale that you'll place on the stage. 
and it's measuring distances in micrometers. So the scale on it, now mine isn't quite to scale, but that scale that you have scratched onto this piece of glass is two millimeters long. And each single division is worth 10 micrometers. Now I've only done every 10 divisions on this, that's what I could fit in on the diagram. So one division is worth 10 micrometers. So 10 of these divisions is um, 100 micrometers long. So if we go through step by step, then how you would use the stage micrometer and the eyepiece graticule to calibrate the graticule. So step one, you'd place your stage micrometer on the stage, look through your eyepiece, and this is what you should see. You have the eyepiece graticule scale, and then line that up directly next to your stage micrometer scale. So that's step one, line them up so they're next to each other, as you can see in this image. Step two, you need to count how many divisions on the eyepiece graticule scale fit into one division on your micrometer scale. Now you might find that easier to work out how I'm doing it in this worked example. We can see here that we have 20 divisions from the eyepiece graticule scale fit into 10 divisions on the stage micrometer scale. So I've got 20 fitting into 10, or in other words, two of the divisions from the eyepiece graticule scale fit into one division of the stage micrometer scale. So we have a ratio of two divisions to one. So now we've got that, we can link it back to what we said about stage micrometers. On our stage micrometer, one division is always worth 10 micrometers. So you can use that to then work out at this magnification, what is one division worth on the eyepiece graticule. So we said one division on the micrometer scale is 10 micrometers. We said two divisions fit into one on the micrometer. And if one division is worth 10, but two fit in each time, it's 10 divided by two. And we know then that on the eyepiece graticule, one division is worth five micrometers at the current magnification. So now you can take out your stage micrometer and put in whatever slide you want to use to measure the distances or um, size of some of the cells or organelles. So I've gone back to the slide that we saw earlier on. And in this case, I'm going to measure the um, distance or the length of the nucleus in this example. Now you would have all of the subdivisions. I've just not shown it in this image. So where we've got 40 to 50, 50 to 60, you would have an extra 10 division so you could see 41 42 43 and so on so we've said that we've worked out that our eyepiece graticule at this magnification one division is worth five micrometers so i'm now going to measure to see how many divisions the nucleus covers um, and i'm estimating that is 13 divisions we've got 10 and there may be three more so the nucleus is 13 divisions long one division is worth 15, so multiply that by our 5. Um, it's one division is worth 5, and we've got 13 divisions. So that means in total, the nucleus actual size, this magnification we've worked out, um, it's 65 micrometers. Now, it will be that um, distance or length even at every magnification. Um, the only thing that would change is what one division on the eyepiece graticule is worth at different magnifications. So the biochemical tests that you need to know are um, tests that are linked to um, looking for the presence of three different types of carbohydrates, proteins and lipids. And the carbohydrates, there's only one of the polysaccharides you need to know the test for, and that is for starch. The reducing sugars test, you would have learned at GCSE, but we go into the details of why it's called a reducing sugar this time. And also a non-reducing sugars test, which will be new. So the test for starch, first of all, the reagent that you have to add is iodine. And in this case, um, I've got my sample of starch. Then you would add your iodine, which is a brownie orange color. If you have starch present, you get a bluey black color. 
So the reagent is iodine. Positive result is orange to blue-black colour formed. Test for reducing sugar. So this is the one you would have learned at GCSE. So in this example, I'm going to be testing glucose, which is a reducing sugar, but also show you um, the result with just distilled water, so you can see what a negative result looks like. So I've added Benedict, which is the bright blue reagent to both samples, and you have to heat for this reaction to work. So the glucose test tube, you can see, is starting to change colour. Water remains blue. And that's what our um, results would be. So for a positive result, you go from blue to orange, for example, glucose. Negative result, it remains blue, and I used water as an example. And you can get other colours other than that bright orange, that brick orangey red colour I've got there. Um, and the different colours would indicate the concentration of reducing sugar you have. So if you only had a green colour or greeny yellow, that indicates a low concentration of reducing sugar. The more orangey red it is, the higher the concentration of reducing sugar. Now you might have noticed in the beaker as the reaction was occurring that the colour changed at the top of my solution first. And I've taken a shot from the video here where we can see that bright orange colour starting to form at the top first and it's yellowy green and almost still blue down here at the bottom of the test tube. So this is the point where just to pause to have a think, why is it that the reaction is occurring first at the top of my solution? So this links to um, physics actually, and it's to do with the idea of convection currents. So the hotter particles in the solution are going to be rising, and therefore the hottest point in the solution in the test tube is at the top. So the molecules will have the most kinetic energy at this point in the test tube, therefore more successful collisions and the reaction will be happening faster, and therefore colour change is happening first at the top. So next, the non-reducing sugar test. The only non-reducing sugar that you learn about is sucrose. So I'm going to test a sample of sucrose. First thing you have to do, though, is confirm it isn't a reducing sugar. So I'm going to do the Benedict's test first, which we can see, leaving it in the hot water with the Benedict for a few minutes, and we've got a negative result. So I'm adding sucrose again to now go on to the next step, and this is acid hydrolysis. So I've added acid to my sample of sucrose, and this time you do have to get it to boiling. So I've got my thermometer in the test tube to make sure the acid does get up to 100 degrees C, so it's boiling, and it has to be boiling for about two minutes for acid hydrolysis to happen. And what we mean by that is we're going to hydrolyze the glycosidic bonds so the sucrose is going to be um, converted into glucose and fructose. So that's our next stage in the video. We have the um, boiling acid for two minutes. I am then going to move it into a beaker of cold water to cool it down for safety reasons. And once it's cool, add an alkali. Then we can add Benedict's and heat again and we'll get a colour change. And you'll start to see again at the top, it's going a red colour until eventually the whole solution. Um, we've now got this brick red precipitate. So the brick red solid is formed at the bottom. So that's our positive result. When we did retest with Benedict's in heat, the Benedict's went from blue to this really um, dark brick red colour to confirm we do have a reducing sugar. So just to summarise then what we mean by the reducing versus non-reducing sugars, the reducing sugars are all of the monosaccharides that you learn. So glucose, fructose and galactose, and two of the disaccharides, lactose and maltose. So the only non-reducing sugar that you learn about is sucrose. And the reason we call them reducing versus non-reducing is these five sugars are able to reduce copper sulfate, which is the blue chemical in Benedict's reagents, and they reduce it to copper oxide. And copper oxide is a rusty brick red colour. So that's why it does convert from that blue to the brick red colour. Sucrose, which is our non-reducing sugar, isn't able to reduce copper sulphate. And that's because the group within these sugars that does the reducing 
is actually used up in the glycosidic bond in sucrose. So it's not going to reduce copper sulfate to copper oxide. Hence the name, it's a non-reducing sugar. The reason it does change colour though eventually is we hydrolyzed sucrose. So we boiled it in acid and in doing that, that breaks the glycosidic bond between the monomers glucose and fructose. So we now end up with those two separate monomers. And when we then do the Benedict's test again, we do get that brick red color. And often you'll find it is a very, very dark brick red color like we had, because you now have two um, monomers in there, glucose and fructose. Whereas when we were just testing for glucose in the previous um, experiment, we just had one sugar. So we had more sugars present. That's why it was that brick red color. So next test is for proteins, and you would add biret, which is another bright blue solution. I've just em emphasised the pronunciation here, so biuret, because often students call it buret, which is incorrect. That is a piece of equipment that you use in chemistry. So biuret is the name of this reagent, and I've got albumin as the protein that I'm going to be using. So I'm adding my sample of protein, adding the bright blue biuret, and a positive result is it turns a purpley lilac colour. So the last test is the test for lipids. And I'm going to use oil as my lipid. And step one is you have to dissolve the lipid in ethanol. So to dissolve it, bung on top, shake it up and it is dissolved. The next stage is you add distilled water and shake it again. Positive result is it's white in colour and it's an emulsion. So you would have to state both of those parts, the color and the fact it's an emulsion. There's no precipitate, there's no solid that has been made, it is just an emulsion. So in summary then, the test for monosaccharides and the disaccharides, with the exception of sucrose, is the Benedict's test. The test for sucrose, which is our non-reducing sugar, would be after a negative Benedict's test, you would then go on to do acid hydrolysis, which is boiling in acid, neutralise with an alkaline, and then heat with Benedict's again and observe the colour change. The test for starch is iodine test, lipids is the emulsion, and proteins is the biuret test. Now that is just a brief summary. In an exam, you would always have to state which chemical you're adding, which is the reagent, the conditions, so that could be whether you have to heat it, whether you have to boil it, do you have to mix to dissolve, um, and lastly the colour change to indicate the presence. So state the starting colour and the positive colour result. And that's what we're going to finish on, just summarising all of the positive test results. So lipids was the white emulsion. Proteins is this purpley lilac colour. Starch, you get blue-black. And reducing sugars, you can get any colour from the green, yellow, orange, brick red. The more dark red it is, the higher the concentration of reducing sugar. So we've got a dark orange in this case. So that's it for the biochemical tests. You need to know the method and the positive test result.